Good morning, everyone. Um, it's nine o'clock. Bell has rung, and we're uh, having their, our session for benefits and services this morning. And let's see. Uh, I'll call the meeting to order. And Sadi, you want to take the roll for us, please? Of course. Good morning, everyone. Miss Bradford. Here. Miss Hendricks. Miss Higa. Here. Good morning. Mr. Keeley, Mr. Prezant, uh -oh. Ms. Erden, here. Yeah. Okay, good morning. For the Director of Finance, Ms. Whitaker, here. For the State, Tre uh, State Treasurer, Mr. Rafina, present. Good morning. For the Superintendent of Public Instruction, Mr. Johnson, here. Good morning. Good morning. For the state controller, Ms. Paquin? Here. Chairperson Yamamoto, you have a quorum. Thank you very much. Um, before I start, I, I just wanted to acknowledge all the bad weather that's happening in, in the world and in our, in our United States. And, and I just you know, hope everybody stays safe and doesn't incur too many uh, catastrophes or, or losses. So, you know, just... We're just hoping for the best and hang in there. Um, we're we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, before I need before I get started, I need to say a few words about um, our our procedures today. And it's it's repetitious, but I we need to we need to really uh, say it for the record. So the board will have a ten minute public comment period at the end of each agenda item. Public comments after each item will be limited to the agenda item topic. There will be an additional opportunity for statements from the public for items not pertaining to a specific agenda item at the end of the open session meeting. Individuals wishing to speak at the board web conference should dial into the public conference line at 833-986-0555 and wait in the call-in queue. Each speaker is allowed a maximum of three minutes for their presentation if there's not enough time for speakers to have three minutes, the timing will be at the discretion of the chair. Teachers Retirement Board meetings are live and web streamed and video archived, which are available to the public on kelsers.com. To protect the privacy of minors who wish to address the board, public comments, commenters under the age of 18 only state their name and affiliated organization, but do not share their personal identify, identifying information such as last name, age, or school. Okay. All right. Um, so let's go with the uh, first item, the approval of our agenda. Can I everybody have a chance to look at it? And do I have a motion? So moved. Okay. Second. It's been moved by Denise, second by Lynn uh, to approve the agenda. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Sidney, we don't have to take a roll call on that one, right? Okay. Okay. Correct. So, let's go to um, the consent agenda for action, the approval of the minutes. Hopefully everybody has a chance to read them. I'll Any? move the minutes. Second. Okay, moved in second. Uh, any discussion? All those in fit. Do we have to take a roll call on that one? No, you don't. <laughs> okay. Okay. They're seeing then the minutes are approved. Okay, so now we move on to item number three. It's it's a consent agenda item for information. And it's on the performance of service performance objectives. Anyone have a comment? Any comments on that? Okay. There's seeing none. Okay. The measures passed. Okay. We'll move on. Um, the next item is number four. Item number four, we're going to allow 30 minutes for, for the presentation and discussion. It's on the member annual member survey. And so, Tom, you want to do that first? Or I saw... 
I saw Cassandra. Cassandra, did you want to lead in with that or just go straight to Tom? No, you can go straight to Tom. He has. Okay. All right. All right, Tom, you've got the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning. Uh, good morning to the members of the committee. I'm Tom Buffalo. I'm the head of research at CalSTRS. And this morning I'll be presenting on the 2021 uh, member survey. Uh, now, this is a survey we do every year. This is fine. We can stay here on this slide. Uh, we do this survey every year. Uh, it actually goes out to the membership in January, and it's a reflection on their experiences uh, with CalSTRS from the prior year. So essentially, this is uh, members telling us their, their experience with CalSTRS um, in the year that was 2020. Um, not shown here, but we had uh, almost 4,300 members respond to the survey. Um, and you know, what's interesting is, and that's a, a roughly a 7% uh, response rate for the number of surveys that we sent out. It's an email survey. And often when I'm presenting our research in different forums, uh, I'm asked, you know, how do we know that we're receiving um, input, sentiment, feedback from the whole membership, um, you know, in particular, our, our uh, older members. And uh, so looking at some of this demographic data, I think we're, we consistently receive good evidence that we in fact are. So take a look at our, uh, our age there of all of our respondents. The youngest is 22, uh, which shouldn't be surprising, some of our youngest members. But look at the age of our oldest member who responded, 98, which I think is fantastic. Again, this is an emailed survey. Uh, so they're receiving the email, they're responding online. Um, so in this case, it was 98. Uh, some research I presented a few years back, our demographic survey, our oldest member was 105. So we, like I mentioned, we are consistently receiving good information, good evidence that we're reaching uh, even our oldest members, uh, despite the fact that we're going out uh, as an electronic survey. Uh, moving to the actives, just kind of halfway through the page there, um, 22 again is our youngest, of course. Our oldest active, 79, which again, not just from a survey perspective, from a life perspective is you know, also just fantastic to see. You know, somebody's still uh, in the classroom at 79, which I think is, is just great. Uh, and then, like I mentioned, our, our youngest retired member is 55, and then our oldest is 98. And then just quickly on the right side there with service credit, uh, maximum of 47 years, you know, almost 48 years in the classroom or service credit, again, just another terrific life accomplishment from um, uh, the member who responded who had 48 years, uh, or has probably still going actually in his 48 years of service. Uh, next slide, please. So right out the gate uh, in the survey, we ask our members uh, just a point blank question, uh, how satisfied were you with CalSTRS overall? And uh, the rating is, is one from completely dissatisfied up to seven, which is completely satisfied. And the way we measure this is we count uh, the proportion who answer a six, which is satisfied or a seven, which is completely satisfied. We take that proportion and then we compare it to prior years. And so despite you know, the year that was 2020, satisfaction actually went up and we received some of the highest satisfaction ratings uh, we've actually seen. So currently 69% of respondents uh, answered either a six or a seven as being uh, satisfied with CalSTRS overall. Next slide, please. So we dug in a little bit deeper as to what is driving satisfaction with CalSTRS. Um, and some interesting insights came from a, a deeper statistical analysis, uh, both from active and retired members uh, when we ran satisfaction up against other items in the survey, um, one in particular that emerged is CalSTRS is an organization I can trust, which I think is uh, you know, essentially excellent news given that our mission is uh, securing the financial future and sustaining the trust of California's educators. So you know, halfway mission accomplished just on this uh, measure alone. Uh, also from the actives, they know that CalSTRS operates in their best interest. Uh, and from the retired CalSTRS cares about members um, like me. And so again, from a deeper statistical analysis, trying to dig into what was driving satisfaction, trust and operating in a member's concern and care for the membership uh, was coming through. Next slide, please. So then we're also curious what was driving trust in CalSTRS, a uh, similar type of a deeper statistical analysis here. Um, communicate from the active perspective, communication, particularly uh, you know, during the pandemic, and then members, active members having confidence that they'll have enough money to live comfortably throughout the retirement years. Those were uh, two items that are driving member, active member trust in CalSTRS. And then from the retired members perspective, just their overall satisfaction with their retirement. And, and again, also communication. So uh, I think our, our communication is, is a big component of what's driving member trust in CalSTRS as can seen between actives and retireds. Next slide, please. 
We also measure uh, a concept we refer to as engagement. And now engagement is considered kind of a deeper construct than just satisfaction. Sometimes satisfaction is mostly just kind of a point in time, whereas engagement measures uh, confidence in an organization, uh, willingness to, to kind of speak well about an organization, trust in an organization. Uh, so we have a section dedicated to engagement um, that we ask the, the membership. Uh, a few of these items, as I move from left to right, you'll see we, we take four of these plus satisfaction, and we use that to calculate uh, what we refer to as an engagement score. And we measure that as well, which I'll talk about in just a second. Um, but just uh, generally speaking, uh, on these standalone items, CalSERS is an organization I can trust. Again, um, that was our highest scoring item. Uh, CalSERS cares about members like me. You can see the, the asterisks next to the items that go into the engagement calculation. So one is uh, I feel confidence uh, that my retirement is secure. I know CalSTRS operates in my best interest. CalSTRS acts ethically. And then on the bottom row there in the middle, CalSTRS sends communications relevant to my needs. So go ahead and go next slide, please. So we take those items, those four items plus satisfaction and we calculate an average score for each member. Uh, each member then receives or each respondent and they receive an, an engagement score. And then we use these kind of thresholds to determine the level of engagement of the membership. So if your average score was less than 2.5, we would consider you disengaged, which is kind of that red. Um, if it's anywhere from 2.5 to 5.5, again, this is also on a, a seven point scale, I should have mentioned, seven point scale, then you're what we just refer to as kind of neutral or swing. And then if it's 5.5 or higher, uh, you are considered an engaged respondent or an engaged member. Uh, and also engagement is the highest it's, it's ever been as well. We're at 60% uh, engaged. And then overall, our average engagement score across the organization is 5.57, um, higher than last year, 5.48. So we're seeing increases in satisfaction and increases in engagement, which again is good given the year that was 2020. Next slide, please. Satisfaction with services. Also, we're seeing this is uh, seeing an increase. We're at 68%. This is just generally, you know, a general question we ask the membership and, you know, just respond um, again on a seven point scale, your overall impression satisfaction with just generally the services offered by CalSTRS. So our services also receiving uh, high satisfaction marks. Next slide, please. Uh, and then certainly kudos to the staff in general. These are the staff and service performance measures. Uh, going across the top, very high scores here, courtesy, knowledge, caring, understanding, um, across the bottom, answers to the questions were thorough, responded in a timely manner. So uh, the staff, and when members do interact with members of our staff, uh, also getting very high scores, which is, is good to see. Next slide, please. Here's, uh, we, you know, given the, the circumstances of the year, we ask questions relative to uh, COVID, one being overall satisfaction with communication, which is um, these two measures did resonate with the membership and drove their trust in CalSTRS. Uh, looking at the bottom actually bar graphs, interesting to see here, another question we asked is the pandemic changed my thoughts on my financial future, looking between actives and retired. Uh, it's interesting to see that uh, to the kind of the bottom right there, 58% in neutral basically. So suggesting that they just Actually, the 58% plus the 20%, which is just, I disagree that it's changed my thoughts about the future. So 78% of the membership didn't really, wasn't really kind of impacted mentally relative to their financial future uh, because of the pandemic, which, you know, we can't necessarily see the full financial picture of a member's household, but we do see roughly half of it with their benefit. And so maybe we can make the assumption that given that they have the stable income from CalSTRS, gives them a little bit more peace of mind, particularly during kind of uh, tumultuous times. Uh, next slide, please. Net promoter score. So this is a measure we actually started um, measuring last year in the 2020 member survey. Uh, net promoter score is commonly used in the private sector. Uh, it was developed in the early 2000s by Bain and Company, the consulting company. Uh, we borrowed their, their question, their methodology, their, their terms uh, in full. So the way this one works is generally the, the pure form of the question is uh, how likely are you to recommend product X service Y to a friend or colleague? And then you rate it from anywhere from a zero, which is not at all likely up to 10, which is extremely likely or very likely. And then the way that the score is calculated is you take the proportion who answered zero through six, 
you subtract that from the proportion who answered nine and 10. So again, this is methodology we're borrowing from um, Bain and Company, their, their net promoter score. So those who answered zero to six, they refer to them as detractors. Those who answer seven and eight are considered passive. And then those who answered nine and 10 are promoters. And so the score is derived from you take your promoters, subtract your detractors, and then you're left with this score. So your score, given that it's an index, can go anywhere from negative 100 up to 100. So taking a look at uh, 2021, essentially what we're doing is subtracting, you know, 29% that red bar from the 43% promoters, uh, that greenish bar, and we're at 14, which is roughly the same as what it was um, back in 2020. So next slide, please. So what's interesting too is, um, you know, we do have pension two, which is our 403B uh, deferred compensation product that is uh, offered via CalSTRS to members, you know, uh, and it competes kind of in this competitive 403B marketplace. Now on the survey, we obviously, we can break it down and look at membership by age, which we're doing here. And I'll explain here in a second. We also have a single question that says, uh, are you aware of CalSTRS pension two? Yes or no. Okay. So just purely just asking awareness, do you know that it exists, that this product is out there, regardless of whether you actually participate in it or not. So let me explain what we're seeing here. So um, age along the bottom, and then you, you can see those bars there. The red bars indicate those who answered, yes, I'm aware that there is pension two. Again, regardless of whether you actually participate, I just know that CalSTRS offers a 403B par, uh, product in the 403B, uh, 403B marketplace. The green bar indicates those who are not aware. So what we're seeing as we move from left to right is despite the negative scores in the younger ages, um, they're still higher just from being aware that pension two exists. So there's something, and then of course, if you move into the older ages, you're seeing quite the discrepancy. Um, the scores go up quite a bit relative to those who are, are unaware. So just members knowing that we offer that product again, which is a, a low cost product, very good um, four, three B and another alternative to, to saving, uh, they trust Calster. So certainly they, if they know about the product, they're likely to also trust uh, the product itself. And so just by knowing that actually increases their impression, their net promoter score of uh, Calsters. And then those horizontal bars across the going uh, kind of across the page there, six is the average score for those who are unaware of pension two. Um, and then it jumps to 22 for those who are aware of pension too. So the presence of that product uh, bodes well for member sentiment of CalSTRS. So next slide, please. So then the next question is, okay, so what is, you know, 14 as, as the organization or even 22 for those aware of pension too, what does that actually mean in the grand scheme of things? So here we've pulled just, um, just kind of a general sample of common brands out there. Like I said, the, the net promoter score is um, used extensively in the, the private sector. Um, and so just to get an idea of, of where scores may range. So Apple, for example, is at a 47. Again, this can be anywhere from negative 100 up to 100. Uh, Apple at 47, Microsoft, Amazon at 25. So Calsters at 14 kind of sits right there in the middle of these uh, sample brands. Uh, what's interesting too is down at the bottom, Bank of America, very low, negative 24. I don't know if that's anybody's personal experience with, with Bank of America. Other financial firms, Wells Fargo is a negative two. Uh, Morgan Stanley's at 16, so CalSTRS is, is kind of on par with that. Uh, quick side note, notice uh, Disney there is minus seven. I'm like, oh, that's kind of weird. And people like Disneyland, they, you know, Disney owns Marvel. And I was talking to uh, Christy Simmons, who's the lead researcher on this project. I'm like, why do you think Disney is, is minus seven? She said, you know, I bet it's because of the way they handled Star Wars. I'm like, oh, yeah, people, you know, the Star Wars fans don't like the way that Disney handled that. Um, but I digress, you know, regardless of that, you know, CalSTRS at 14 is outperforming, you know, both the Avengers and the Skywalkers uh, in terms of net promoter score. Uh, next slide, please. And finally, satisfaction with retirement. You know, we started asking this last year in 2020. Uh, the number has not changed, but it is very high. Still 90% of uh, retired members are satisfied with their retirement. And again, we, we only see roughly half of the financial picture um, in a member's life, if you will, in retirement uh, via their, their benefit. Um, but when, again, our mission is securing the financial future and sustaining the trust of California's educators, this is a good indication that uh, we are completing the first half of that mission of securing their financial future. So 90% of members say they are satisfied with retirement. Uh, and we are happy, of course, to see that given that we you know, are a part of that as well. So 
with that, I'm actually um, complete, don't have a finalizing slide, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Any questions from members of the board? Tom, I just had, I just had one question. When I know that some time ago that you, we talked about the, the member handling the financial um, uh, issues of the family and, and who completed the survey. Mm -hmm. Was there any other um, question that would lead to, to knowing that if, if it's like a two, a, 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 a member and a spouse say, and who, who answered the question was the person answering the question, the holder of the financial information of that particular family. Yeah, yeah. So we do ask that question. It's essentially just, you know, are you the primary decision maker? What's your role in the household in, in making decisions about the uh, finances of the household? Options are I'm a primary decision maker. Uh, I share responsibility. Somebody else does it. I'm just sort of answering the survey and then uh, just an, an other catch all category. And um, by and large, you know, about 98 ish percent either say I'm the primary decision maker or I share decision making um, in this in my household. And so we're feel comfortable that we're hearing from those who are uh, either directly involved with their finances or, um, you know, they're discussing it with their, their spouse or partner or whoever else um, shares those responsibility in the household. We're, we're basically those who are responding to the survey um, fall in broadly in those two categories. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. I see Joy and then Denise. Great. Thank you, Karen. Um, you know, Tom, I don't really have a question. I think I just wanted to make a, a couple of comments. Um, first, um, I, I think it's interesting that um, we're trying the NPS um, approach, because one of the things I find um, interesting about that is it's not, it's to your point, it's not just me measuring satisfaction, but it's also having to address um, detractors. Um, and it, so it, I think it causes you to think about um, your results and your opportunities um, differently than if you were just measuring, um, you know, sort of positive or, or satisfaction results. So, um, so I'll be interested to see how how that how that trends, and also, um, you know, the extent to which we take a look at the data and think about what opportunities we have to try to um, decrease our detractors. Um, and then the other comment that I just wanted to make um, was just back on slide nine in terms of the staff performance metrics and member satisfaction, um, you know, or sort of member response to um, staff performance um, and, and service performance. Um, you know, it, it's been such a hard year, um, not just for our members, but for our staff. And the fact that we were able in this environment um, and working remotely to be as responsive um, and there for our members as, as we are and that continue to be, I just wanted to recognize, I think it's so important. And um, you know, to, so to, you know, Bill and Cassandra and your teams, um, you know, just hats off. It's just, it's a great job. And it's so um, heartening to know that we continue to, to, um, to be there for our members, um, you know, despite, um, you know, to, to support them to, through challenging times, but also um, in spite of whatever challenging times we're going through ourselves. So just want to say thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly I agree. And if I can comment too, back on the, the net promoter score concept, we are um, kind of adopting it on a variety of different pieces of research that we conduct, not just our annual member surveys. Um, we have what we refer to as our, our, our member journey surveys. So if the member retires, we'll survey them at the end of the, um, the month that they retire. Uh, if they go through our disability process or communities, um, uh, community property process, just a variety of different interactions with us. We've actually started using the net promoter score on those as well. Again, to kind of measure, you know, where the, the member sentiment is uh, relative to those particular services. And of course, you know, the, the um, relative to the annual member survey. So yeah, we're very interested in and curious to see how it um, kind of how it performs and just a you know, different variety of services that Kelsters offers. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. Thank you. Um, Bill and Cassandra, did you want to, I see you popped on. Did you want to say something right now or do you want to wait? No, I, I just wanted to uh, acknowledge Joy's comments. I really appreciate that the staff are working really hard in this environment. And um, I know that they really uh, appreciate the comments that you provided, Joy. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Joy. Uh, Denise? 
Thanks, Karen. Um, I just wanted to kind of jump onto that as well and say thank you to all the staff. Um, it's been definitely unprecedented times and that we can keep um, our satisfaction up so high is awesome. Um, one other thing I've read, and I'm sorry I didn't write the page, but I thought it was also super interesting that most of our members look at the CalSTRS, my CalSTRS on uh, an iPad or a computer as opposed to a phone. Um, I know we've talked several times about the security of having an app, but if that kind of just highlighted to me that we really don't need to talk about that right now <laughs> because they're really not looking at, um, at their my CalSTRS on their phone anyway. So I just wanted to highlight that. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Denise. Sharon. Good morning, Thank Sharon. Thank you. Good morning. Um, um, thanks for those comments. Uh, Denise, I was actually, this, this is a little awkward, but I would say actually, I'm using more apps on my phone and I wonder if people would use their phones more if there was an app is how I was thinking about it. So whichever way you guys are the experts on this. So um, however you do it, but I, I was just with a member the other day and uh, a CalPERS member actually. And I'm just realizing, you know, more and more, if we can catch people when we're in conversations and be able to do it quickly and just you know, zip it up would be great. But I know there's security issues and things like that. But um, but my question was really more maybe to you, Bill, um, in terms of as you oversee, you know, our, our benefits area, when you look at this is all positive and it's great to see, especially during COVID, I mean, the call times, which is what I always hear about, you know, I was on the phone for an hour, you know, I don't hear that anymore. I mean, people are really happy with the responsiveness of getting questions answered and things like that. But what's your takeaway as the executive overseeing in terms of there's still lessons to be learned and there's still growing edges and there's still areas to improve on. And how, when you look at something like this, how do you think about um, where you want to continue to grow and have staff um, continue to kind of move those numbers up? And if you could maybe have specific examples of areas that you would still like to see improvement on, if you could comment on that. Overall, sure. great positive, but I am always looking at how we can how we can be better, right? Uh, yes, absolutely. I, I'd say one, uh, first of all, uh, I think our focus is one of continuous improvement. So even with uh, very positive results, uh, we don't rest on our laurels, so to speak. Um, increasing online utilization, for one, uh, when you compare the turnaround times for processing certain um, basic transactions uh, handled by paper versus online, online is instantaneous. So DocuSign has afforded us a, a significant boost in that, but we still see significant opportunities there. Um, in terms of our outreach to members, uh, one area that we are continually striving to improve upon, as we've touched upon earlier, this uh, pandemic did afford us the opportunity to uh, leverage a mechanism by which we could reach a, a far wider audience. And so we will continue doing that even post return to our member service centers, um, looking to focus there on our opportunity to engage one on one with members, but also realizing that um, we certainly were unable to reach three, four, 500 members in one benefits planning session when we were trying to do that in a physical site. So um, we will leverage a balance of having some opportunity for individuals that wish to commute into the member service center for a group planning session to do so, um, but also are reimagining how we can reach a broader audience across the state. Uh, and then with regard to um, our other key component, which we're working on, uh, which ultimately does have a very significant impact on our members. Uh, we're looking at we can, how we can focus on the incoming information from our employers to assure accurate data for um, a secure and uh, stable retirement flow uh, once members transition. And as you know, there's a significant effort underway uh, on that. And um, I'm hopeful and confident that uh, we'll end up in a place where ultimately uh, we have mechanisms to uh, mitigate 
some of the challenges that we have post-retirement right now. So those are three areas I can think of um, off the top of my head that, that we will uh, focus on. But I would say, again, um, we don't um, rest on good performance. For one, I would love to see our uh, net promoter score uh, go beyond the teens. And um, that's going to be an ongoing focus for us in, in the coming uh, years as well. Great. Thanks, Bill. I, I think that like every org- like lots of organizations dealing with COVID, I think retooling and how we think about coming out of this into all the strengths of, of what we learned during COVID and the online environment, and then kind of hopefully taking the strengths and leaving the weaknesses and, and creating a new uh, future, I think is, is really thoughtful. And I also just always have to note on the member engagement by life stage, you know, we still have so much work to do at that first, you know, that I was just like on page nine, you know, and just that 20, 20 something, 30 something, 40 something, um, those, those decades, we still have a lot of work to do to reach them to start getting them in pension too and thinking about security earlier. So that's a lifelong mission of mine. So thank you, Bill. Thanks, thanks uh, Tom, for the great research. Great. Thanks, Sharon. Um, I don't see anyone else. Just want to thank Tom and your team for, for all the research. And, and I think the net promoter score, as, as uh, others have said, is, is so interesting. And and where Kelsers lands in relationship to the other um, well-known companies and organizations. So thanks very much for your work. And um, unless, do you have any last thoughts, Tom? No, I'm good, thank you. Okay, good. All right, thank you very much. Um, Do we have any callers that would um, like to make a public comment at all? Um, There are no callers on the line right now. Great. Okay. Thank you very much, Tom, and look forward to the the future research information. All right. Thank you. All right. Okay. Now we will go to item number five, which is the outstanding death benefit update. And I see Melissa. Here we go. All right. Go ahead. Good morning, Madam Chair and committee members. Um, I'm Melissa Adams. I'm the Director of Disability and Survivor Benefits, and I'm pleased to be here with you today to provide this update on our the status of our outstanding death benefits. We know this is a very important component of our death benefit plan and our commitment to our members. Some of you may recall that I have provided a, a, both Um, a survivor benefits overview, as well as a death benefit update in 2018, 2019, and most recently in November of 2020. Today, our focus will be solely on the outstanding death benefits um, rather than inclusive of the survivor benefit overview. So with that, we can move to the next slide, please. And so today, as I mentioned, we'll cover the outstanding death benefits payable. I'll talk a little bit about the outreach and education to members and retirees, and we'll also address uh, planned future service enhancements. Uh, In addition to the items that are on the slide here, um, I I wanted to share that in order to get a better sense of where CalSTRS stands, Um, as it relates to what other systems are experiencing with their death and survivor programs. Uh, With the help of Tom Buffalo's group, we surveyed our peers through the CEM benchmarking network, as well as the NASRA network, which is the National Association of State Retirement Administrators. In response to our inquiry, we received about 19 responses in total Uh, representing uh, at least 16 different states. So as I walk through the slides today, I will share just a few tidbits of the information that we received back from those surveys also. Next slide, please. So we have this slide here just to um, share really our, our guide for reporting on this particular population to the board. We have an education code section that requires CalSTRS to uh, report monthly to the board concerning outstanding death benefits payable 
that have not been paid within six months of having received the notification of death of the member. Um, all of, uh, so one, this is one of the questions that we received a response um, back from some of our peers and uh, it, the response was mixed. Some other systems have this similar requirement while some do not. And the way that we share this information with the board members, um, CalSTRS prepares a monthly report on the outstanding death benefits payable, and we post that quarterly to the Teacher Retirement Board website. Next slide, please. So why do we have outstanding death benefits? There are really two main reasons why benefits go outstanding. We are typically either missing information that's required to process the case, or we are unable to locate the designated beneficiary. It is important to know that for, for these cases where we still have outstanding death benefits that um, have been kind of pending for six months or, or longer, um, CalSTRS is exhausted at that point, Every, all its due diligence to locate the beneficiaries, or we have made numerous attempts to work with the beneficiaries to get the necessary information. Examples of information that we could be missing um, in order to pay the case it could be the death certificate. It could be um, information to, to validate the beneficiary or um, distribution information for the benefits that are payable. Once we've exhausted those leads, we do pause processing just to um, remove the case from the open caseload. And we have a quality assurance process to make sure that um, adequate attempts have been made to locate the beneficiaries or obtain documentation. And then, of course, processing will always resume if we receive the information that's needed or if um, new contact uh, uh, arises from the beneficiary or if we uh, ourselves are able to uh, find information to reach out to the beneficiaries. Uh, this is another area on the, the common causes that we did receive some responses from our peers on. And uh, the survey, our survey results show that the most common reason for a benefit being unpaid among our peers is, is also being unable to locate the beneficiary. Next slide, please. So um, this is a slide that we've shared before in the presentation. Uh, the chart displays the total dollar amount and case count of survivor benefit cases, comparing those that have been paid to those with remaining unpaid benefits and aged beyond six months from the notification of death. I do want to point out that this slide that I'm sharing with you now has been updated from the time that it was first posted to uh, the board's site. Uh, we had a slide that had data through July of 2021 um, but this slide goes, uh, uh, displays data from 2001 through July of this year. So it's the most recent information. So I just wanted you to be aware in case you see that uh, in inconsistency in, in the uh, slide that you first viewed. So um, it's for 20 years then? We it's for 20 years. years. Yes. And the reason we start from 2001 is that's when START was implemented. So this is taking all of the information that we have in our current pension administration system. So um, important to note from this slide and, and just the history of our ratio of paid to unpaid cases, it has remained consistent for the years that we've been tracking it that about 92% of all cases end up being paid while 8% um, fall into that unpaid category. And cases come in and out of, out of the unpaid group. If we get that additional information, we're, we're able to pay the case. Um, this is another question that we did pose to our peers and 12 responses were received. Um, the average unpaid death 
uh, percentage was 7.6%, while CalSTRS is 8%. So we are pretty close to what the, the average is of those that reported to us. The lowest was about 1%. Um, that was New York STRS, uh, State Teachers Retirement System, and the highest percentage of unpaid cases was 25.9%, and that was reported by Texas Retirement System. So this, um, these survey responses are uh, pretty hot off the press from NASRA in the last week. So, um, it does give us some information so that we can go connect with our peers, especially for those systems that are reporting lower um, percentages of, or higher paid rates than what we're experiencing just to see, um, to better understand why that is and if there's any best practices that we can employ or adopt to help increase our percentage of paid cases. Next slide, please. And so often um, we've been asked what happens to those unpaid dollars and they remain in the teacher's retirement fund until, until we are actually able to resolve and pay the case. Uh, our peers reported a similar practice um, that they also will suspend efforts once they've uh, exhausted their leads and are unable to collect the documents needed to pay. And their benefits are also held indefinitely until either a beneficiary steps up or uh, necessary documentation is received. Next slide, please. So I just wanted to, um, again, talk about that good faith effort to exhaust all leads. We, um, over the long term, we end up paying about 92% of the cases. Um, we use our third party um, demographic and person location services to, to look for beneficiaries. And for those cases that we uh, that end up going cold for us, we do post them on our unclaimed property website. We continue to monitor for additional information coming into the system that will allow us to resume processing of those cases. And next slide. And um, of course, an additional critical ongoing and proactive efforts that CalSTRS takes on center on education of our membership and communication. Throughout the member's career and into retirement, CalSTRS engages in a number of outreach efforts to increase member awareness around the various aspects of retirement as well as preparing for a sound financial future. Uh, this of course includes the benefits that are associated with survivor benefits and education about what happens when the member passes away. Some of those communication efforts includes, include newsletters that are targeted toward both active and retired educators. We include information in the retirement progress reports for active members and our retirement readiness group conducts lots of workshops and individual planning sessions that also contain information about survivor benefits and, and how to ensure they're designated, uh, they are designated, designating, excuse me, beneficiaries um, and keeping them current and timely. Next slide. And there are also additional resources available on CalSTRS website um, that includes you know, specific publications like our member handbook and the Protecting Your Loved One brochure that focus on um, survivor benefits. We have our benefit specialists and the retirement readiness group that do the pointed education and you've heard Sandy Blair talk a lot about the workshops and the individual planning sessions that they do to educate our members. All right, I think we're moving on to the next slide, please. Additional publications include fairly new member kits that are targeted at uh, various stages of our members' careers. And although I don't have a specific slide for it, um, in survivor benefits, we do 
outreach um, periodically to uh, to reach our members who do not have beneficiary designations on file. In fiscal year 1920, we performed outreach on approximately 30,000 accounts, and that resulted in a 27% response rate and allowed us to update 23% of those 30,000 accounts, which was about 5,500. In this current fiscal year, oh, excuse me, uh, fiscal year 2021, we uh, targeted about 5,000 accounts with um, missing designations. And we have a planned email campaign planned for October of this year, targeting uh, members that are over the age of 70 that do not have a beneficiary designation on file or who have missing demographic information from their existing beneficiary designations. Next slide, please. I know you um, will be hearing more about pension solution. I've talked about um, some of these future um, enhancements that will be part of pension solution that will allow us to be uh, more proactive in ensuring that when a member does pass away, that we have the information available to us at that time uh, that will allow us to pay benefits more, more timely. Um, rather than having to search for individuals at that time. So a few of the um, improvements that we're expecting with Pension Solution include automated and targeted reminders across different platforms. Uh, for example, emails, regular mail, and uh, eventually text messages. It allows us to uh, adjust um, that communication more easily based on different member demographics and for various reasons, um, including completing a designation that may not, that is not complete or um, ensuring that members update those designations so that we have accurate information to contact the beneficiaries. These enhancements are expected to assist members with maintaining up-to-date designations and to better position CalSTRS to quickly locate the beneficiaries and pay death benefits. And next slide, please. So this um, is pretty much wrapping up the, the presentation for today. Um, we did talk, or I did talk about the outstanding death benefits payable, that ratio that has been consistent over several years of 92% paid to 8% that tend to go unpaid. Um, the various types of outreach and education that we do to members and retirees and some of the expectations we have in the future for um, being able to uh, improve our uh, service in this area. Uh, I, I do always like to um, you know, remind you all that we do have a staff in survivor benefits that is really dedicated to, to serving beneficiaries and um, you know, not only paying benefits, but working with them in a compassionate and empathetic, uh, empathetic way. And the, the staff is beyond um, survivor benefits. It really starts with our retirement readiness group who's educating um, proactively in the beginning stages. As we strive to pay all cases, a relatively small number of cases go unpaid, though we're always looking to increase that amount. We would love to pay every single case that comes, um, comes our way. And um, for survivor benefits, it's an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Having a current beneficiary designation on file it is the best way to um, position CalSTRS to be able to pay those benefits right away. Yes, that's great. Thanks, Melissa. And, and that's, what, that's what, what's so important is it, no matter if you're active or retiree, a retiree, you've, you need to do that form and need to update it. If, if there are any life changes that, that you have. So thanks very much for your presentation. And it looks like we have um, a couple of members. So Lynn and then Sharon. Uh, thank you, Karen. And thank you, Melissa, for the presentation on this subject. I, I know it's very difficult to try to um, find beneficiaries if the information is not up to date and appreciate all of the outreach by your staff and 
looking forward to the added benefits or capabilities that Pension Solution will add. And my question is, I understand that you said that the majority of the unpaid benefits are because the beneficiary information isn't up to date. But in those cases where there is a beneficiary that comes forward and there's an issue with processing, is it because they don't have uh, certain pieces of information or I think you mentioned they don't can't provide a death certificate. And if that is the case, uh, is your team able to help walk them through the process or make contact with local authorities that might be able to help them obtain that? Yes, so um, there are instances where um, a beneficiary may have difficulty getting a, a death certificate. Um, I think that's probably more rare than typical for the missing documentation piece um, because family members are usually uh, able to get a copy of the death certificate uh, faster than CalSTRS can. But there are times when we will um, reach out to another state or a county to obtain the death certificate if uh, uh, a beneficiary is having um, difficulty with that. Um, when For the cases where we have a beneficiary and there's missing documentation, sometimes the, it may seem strange, but there are some times when a beneficiary just doesn't either at the time doesn't want it, or it may be too consumed with something else. Um, there are different reasons why, why they don't, but if there's anything that CalSTRS can do to assist them with that process, we do, and we will. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Sure. Thank you. Ms. Sharon. Great, thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, Melissa, thanks. And I just wondered, um, back to our iPhone app and pension solution and kind of our tech future, I get, you know, I get dings on my phone all the time saying, hey, Sharon, you know, update your information at American Express or whatever the company is. And I'm just wondering, um, either with the pension solution update or are there, is there are there ways, again, we can be uh, proactive with our membership to be able to um, get people to do that? I know, I'll be honest, I'll admit it took me like four years of even being on the board to sign up as a one-time be death beneficiary because it's it's like going to the dentist. It's something you just don't think about or you just put on your list and don't get to it. And it's so critical. And we at the, on the board recognize when we see these statistics, you know, 8% and the $87 million that are unpaid. Um, so I just wondered what, what kinds of things can we do kind of on the front end? I know we can only control so much, but of, of being able to, um, reach out to our members instead of waiting for them to check their Cal my calsters or something to um, to communicate with them and kind of give them a red flag that they need to make sure they do this one-time death beneficiary. So um, that is part of the outreach um, that I briefly touched on um, during the presentation. We are biggest population that we targeted in the last few years was that 30,000 in fiscal year 1920. And at this point, um, well, for that outreach effort, that was by regular mail. The, the effort that we're planning in October will be via email. So we, we, we can pull a request for all um, members with e email addresses and identify that those who do not have a designated beneficiary on file. So right now, those are some of the things that we do to, to um, be proactive in outreaching to members. Um, it, uh, in addition to those newsletters, we put articles in the newsletters at, at least once a year about the importance of updating designations. When we move into pension solution, it will be um, easier for us to do larger scale um, outreach efforts and on a regular basis to those who either do not have a designation on file or whose designation is dated. Um, you know, when we first started Pension Solutions, Sharon, we, we talked a lot about you, a mobile app um, and having some of these features in a mobile app. Right now that has been um, pushed out 
to be considered in optimization efforts while we get the core of our system in place. But those are, I, I think, um, you know, potential enhancements that CalSTRS may consider once we get through the initial implementation of pension solution. And I know we're dealing with the intergenerationality of our membership. And so I, even just talking to my mom yesterday, I mean, there's just different people are different, are comfortable with different modes of communication. I love texting. Uh, you know, my mom wants to talk on the phone and likes paper mail. And so I, I just think as, as many modalities as we can cover to, to just, because I think sometimes members just don't even know what the one-time death beneficiary is. They don't know that they're not signed up for it. Um, so it's just kind of, and I know we don't always have the most up-to-date information on our membership. So, but as many modalities as we can try and hit and as proactive as we can be, I know staff are already thinking about this, but um, would love to get those numbers down on the unpaid side as much as possible. So thanks, Melissa. Thanks. Ashish, do you want to add anything? No, I think uh, Melissa covered it. Actually, what we are doing, we are taking the baby steps. We are just ready technology will be ready for the infrastructure side and we can turn on one at a time because we have to take the baby steps because just like you mentioned, we have you know, 90 plus, 100 plus, you know, the members as well as the millennials coming, right? So uh, I think of when we started the pension solution, we just thought that maybe we have a responsive website, my Kelsers, we put more, more automation in there. A lot of alerts is going out but we found out that not a lot of people are utilizing that one. So just like I think golf delivery, uh, Melissa mentioned, now we know who is opening up the email, who is not even looking at the email. I think those kind of statistics is helping us to just to pave the path for the forward. And I, I know the security is always the top of the mind, but as we move forward in the pension solution, as well as other caster.com, we are another initiative we are doing, how will be much more reaching out to the other members in a different, different platform, not only IE, Safari, you know, Chrome, the tablets. We have a wide range of areas in there. So great, great. Thanks, Madam Chair. That's all I have. Thanks, Sharon. Lynn, we saw your hand up. Did you have another comment that you wanted to make? No, no, I, sorry, okay. that was a mistake. Okay, all right. Any other members wishing to make a comment or have questions or anything? Okay, and do we have any public comments on this item? There are no callers in the queue right now. Okay, great, all right. Okay, thank you very much, Melissa. Look forward to seeing that, that number go down and you know, thanks to your team for all the work that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Okay, so we are nearing the end of our agenda so quickly. Thank you, everyone. Um, we're on item number seven, am I right? For the draft um, agenda for the next committee meeting. Um, hope you all had a chance to look at it. Bill, any thoughts on this? Any more things that we need to add? Um, not at this time. Okay. Anyone else? So we're going to do the triennial health study and the member education and engagement efforts. Yes. Oh, okay. All right. So we'll go on. And hopefully January 22, location to be determined, hopefully will be determined soon. So thank you, everyone. Okay. Any other closing comments from the public? Uh, there are still no callers in the queue. Okay. All right. Thanks, everyone. Um, I see Mr. Keeley. Mr. Keeley. Uh, oh, did you? I see Cassandra and Jill. Did you have anything that you wanted to add? Okay. So, Mr. Keeley, what's the what's the plan for the next few hours? Uh, we'll, we'll, why don't we uh, take a fifteen minute break and we'll come back at nine forty five. For close. <laughs> um, we're going to log into closed session immediately. Is that correct, Cassandra? 945, we'll log into closed session. Okay. All right. Okay. See everyone at uh, 945 in closed session. All right. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Good afternoon, everyone. I'd ask uh, Jennifer if you could please take the roll for us. Sure. Ms. Higa? Oh, sorry. Ms. Bradford? 
Here. And Ms. Hika, I'm sorry about that. I just That's okay. Here. Mr. Prezant? Here. Ms. Erden? Here. Ms. Yamamoto? Here. For the Director of Finance, Ms. Miller? Here. For the State Treasurer, Mr. Rufino? Here. For the Superintendent of Public Construction, Mr. Johnson? Here. And Controller Yee? Here. Person Kelly have quorum. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, if I could, we could approve the open session agenda, entertain a motion for approval. Move approval, Mr. Chair. Second. Thank you, Ms. Miller. Thanks, Ms. Higa. It's been moved and properly seconded to approve the open session agenda for today's meeting. Without objection, the agenda has been approved. There's no items to report from our previous or earlier closed session item, so it brings us directly to our first item in open session. Prashant, I'll turn it over to you. We have 15 minutes allotted for this item. Okay. Thank you and good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the board. And thank you for the opportunity to provide pension solution project updates. Today, I'm joined by Ashish and Bill, our project sponsors, Graham Finley from Independent Project Oversight and Virginia Williams from CGI. As requested during the last board meeting, staff has provided an interim report update to address board's specific questions in addition to the regular project update. Since those reports already cover all the relevant details, I'm gonna keep my update very brief and only touch upon three key items in my prepared update. The first item is about the latest progress on the revised schedule. On August 20th, CGI delivered a revised schedule for Callister's review. In addition to the necessary time extension, that revised schedule has two notable attributes. First, it combines FR2, function rollout 2 and function rollout 3 into one single rollout at Golai. And second, it adds a soft launch component before that single rollout. Soft launch means providing our business users a chance to experience the production-like environment once the new system is stable enough after most of the testing is done before the go live. This is a helpful risk mitigation strategy and confidence booster exercise for our stakeholders. Calisters and oversight consultants have started to review the draft revised schedule delivered to us. Part of review, we look for completeness and accuracy of the remaining task to the extent possible. Look for to verify if the proper dependencies between the tasks have been identified and also to review assumptions made. CGI is expected to complete the resolution of review feedback by the end of next week. The second item has already been communicated before, but I do want to reiterate that again. While the revised schedule is being developed and reviewed, both Calisters and CGI project team have continued to work hard and make progress across various work streams. In other words, the project continues to make progress while waiting for the revised schedule. The progress made since the last board meeting is, is specified in the report we submitted, so I will not repeat the same information here. The last item, but not the least one, is about our teams on the ground on both sides of organization. I want to take a moment to recognize and commend all the project team members, business subject matter experts, and the business users across the organization who continue to work very, very hard to ensure that we get a system that can pay accurate benefit to our members at GoLive. I also want to commend them to continue finding much needed balance between supporting business operations, supporting project needs, and also to work in determining a revised schedule. It's their passion for the work that has allowed us to make progress despite facing these challenges. And they are the reason why we remain confident in our ability to continue marching forward while navigating through current challenges. With that, I would like to invite Graham Finley from Independent Project Oversight to provide his assessment, and then we can take any questions you may have for us. All right. Thanks, Prashant. I mean, I, I don't want to add too much since I think you've covered, um, you know, the majority of the points. I think maybe the 
One thing I would re-emphasize is in the activities that have been happening over the last few weeks to review the draft schedule. Um, the, there are a series of assumptions that that schedule is based on that have been worked on over the last couple of months, in fact, and it's really a, it's really a distillation of the experience of the project over the last six months or so in terms of ability to you know, proceed on testing and the lessons that have been learned about ability to be productive and what the, you know, what the impact of the testing results have had on scheduled progress. And so the, the schedule that's been put together is a reflection of that but it's only a rough, it's only a, um, a confident projection in as much as those assumptions prove to be true. And so I think we're continuing to monitor both in the testing results as they're coming in to see, for example, how many um, problem incident reports come up from each test case, as well as the ability to deploy the necessary resources in order to be able to maintain the necessary productivity. Because unless those assumptions that have, you know, basically the the data that we've used to build the schedule, unless that data is accurate in terms of informing our future assumptions, we can't necessarily have a lot of confidence in the projected schedule going forward. So it's important to sort of recognize that there's a lot of been work put into the schedule development to date, but our confidence in the projection of the ability to meet those dates is contingent upon those assumptions continuing to be true. With that, I'll uh, we'll take any questions. Thank you, Mr. Finley. Open up to questions or comments from my colleagues. Let's start with uh, the hands that I see in front of me. Uh, Ms. Miller from the Department of Finance, followed by Controller Yee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I is CGI on as well? Yes, they are. Okay. Um, Mr. Chair, with your permission, some of these questions, I think, go to CGI if, if they're able to respond. Certainly. Let's uh, uh, bring Thank CGI you. onto the screen, please. Thank Representatives you. from CGI. And if you could just introduce yourself. Good afternoon, board members. I'm Virginia Williams, and I'm a senior vice president at CGI. And I also have Nick Egrios, also a senior VP at CGI on the poll. Thank you for being here. I'll uh, yield the floor back to Ms. Miller. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank you, Ms. Williams and um, Mr. Agrios. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the last time we had the opportunity to speak with you was about seven months ago, and, and we asked a series of questions, many of which weren't followed up on. So I have um, another series today. Um, they fall into categories of, of significant concern that we have in... It, really in three areas, I'm gonna to get to some specific questions. And the um, we're concerned about the timeline, the lack of resources, and I really wanted to drill down on the lack of resources from CGI, potential extra costs. And then um, I just wanna be clear that, that whenever you work with the state, especially on a project that began in 2014, and you know, there's, there's reputational vulnerability for all of us because our number one priority is that when our members, the, the core of the really societal fabric, I don't mean to overstate that, when teachers go online to get their benefits, we expect them to get them. You know, they're, they're the reason we're all here. And I think um, not taking kind of that, the view of how incredibly important this service is. And I, I really do hold CGI accountable for that because obviously CalSTRS understands that mission. I'd really like to make sure we understand the answer. So my, my biggest question to you, Ms. Williams, and I, I hope you'll relay this to your CEO first and foremost is a question of resources. And I'm gonna ask you very candidly not to talk about the pandemic. I think as a technology company, I would expect that the ability to navigate a pandemic, especially given the strengths and the core competencies of your company, is actually not the reason. The, the direct resources that have been committed to this project, how project leadership roles, how you intend in a timely manner to keep the project moving forward, and how, what and whom you expect to dedicate to CalSTRS in order to ensure not just completion, and I wanna be really careful to, to explain this, this isn't about completing the project, it's about completing an incredibly complex and deliberately 
user-friendly product that you've committed to all along. So I'm gonna start there and then with your permission, Mr. Chair, I actually have a, a few other questions. You so, simply, uh, simply let me know, uh, Ms. Miller, when you wanna yield the floor. Use this time to ask all the questions that you have. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Board Member Miller, uh, yeah. we did respond to your questions uh, several months ago. We were instructed to send that response to CalSTRS, and we did. If you'd like to see that response uh, directly from us, we certainly can resend it to you. Um, the resources are challenging, that's true, but, there, but we have a number of key staff who have been on this project since its inception. We've had really good stability uh, on, in many of the key staff roles. We are uh, working diligently to backfill two key staff roles right now. Um, and uh, we have one of those lined up to be filled. And another one that we plan to put a temporary resource in as we think that the uh, resources that are preferred by CalSTRS will come available the first of the year. Additionally, we do some of the development work offshore and we have built a bench of developers offshore uh, uh, during this pandemic time. We have staffed and built that bench so that we can stay on track. So efforts are underway and I could certainly follow up with some more details that um, your concern is understood and it is a, um, a, a point of focus for us. Great, with the permission of the chair, I think we would like to have um, in writing kind of the resource commitment and the level of team members that will be committed and that will see this project now through to fruition and I think Given, given where we are six years later, I think what we'd like to see Ms. Williams is either you or your CEO actively involved in oversight of, the, of these resources, because obviously that's, that has been one of the major obstacles to completion. Um, so I think, so that's sort of the, the first question on resources. Um, I just wanna repeat back what I heard from you, which is that you're developing talent offshore and you will have a plan for talent not until the first of the year. Did I hear that correctly? For one of the resources, for one of the key resources that I think we have been challenged in filling, we have offered a number of candidates that for one reason or another have not been selected by the project team. Um, but uh, as we work through that process, finding that right combination of knowledge and skill, uh, we are going to assign a uh, very strong candidate, has three years experience with the product that we're implementing, lives here locally in Sacramento, and has delivered large systems implementation. And we're gonna put forward that candidate to fill that one key staff role with the idea that there will be other candidates that do become available at the first of the year for the CalSTRS projects uh, evaluation. But I have a lot of confidence in this resource that we're putting in temporarily and would and have recommended that he actually be a permanent uh, candidate. But nevertheless, we're going to put him in the role permanently because we think another couple of candidates become available in January and we'd like to present those to CalSTRS as well. And as for myself, in terms of executive leadership, Board Member Miller, I am a Sacramentan. I'm not going anywhere. I was born and raised here, educated here. And so I intend to stay with the CalSTRS project. Um, thank you for that. I, I'm gonna come back to perhaps to our team on the question of, of this resources. I, I'm just gonna, I'm a little bit concerned that we know resources are an obstacle and we. it sounds like we don't have a plan. It sounds like we have an interim plan with with then a, and then yet another change in January. So it, it, I'd like to make sure we understand that continuity plan. Um, maybe Mr. Chair, if it's okay, if I could ask um, Mr. Mittal, does that, is that what you expect in terms of resource commitment or, or, Ms., or the CEO? I don't know who best to, to answer that question. Sure, uh, I can take a shot at it. So, so to me, uh, there are two types of challenges with the resources. One is CGI ability to 
fill the resource, the, the key positions in a timely manner. And second, making sure we have sufficient and skilled resources to stay on track to complete tasks on time. So, that, so there are two different things. And the, the key resources uh, are probably two, as Virginia is saying. But when it comes to ensuring we have sufficient and skilled resources to complete tasks on time, I personally feel that we are lacking in the both, both the areas and both the areas needs to be strengthened further in order to stay on track with the revised plan. That's very helpful. Thank you. Ms. Lichnock, were you going to comment on that? And then I, I was I was just going to reiterate that that same point that it's 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 two areas of key resources and sufficient resources to uh, staff the project to get it to completion. And I I wasn't sure I heard that part from um, Ms. Williams. So I didn't know if she was, I thought that she was only speaking about key resources, but not the number and volume of resources necessary. So maybe if if she could ask answer that part. So I, I actually spoke a little bit to both of those. Um, uh, Cassandra, um, the development resources that are offshore, the bench that we're creating uh, so that we can account for when folks are sick or need to care for loved ones who are sick, uh, that we have the backfills ready to go for those positions. So in building that bench offshore, that is a, a one method for us to um, make sure that we have the resources to stay on track. Additionally, we need to settle in on the schedule. The schedule drives timelines and resource needs. And uh, you have my commitment that when we have all stacked hands on the schedule and have agreed to it, uh, that we will resource to that schedule. Absolutely. Um, okay, I'm gonna, uh, let me ask then a question. So th that seems to me, Ms. Williams, like a chicken and an egg, excuse my dog in the background. Um, you know, whether resources or a schedule drive, I think these are, that's a complex question. And I, I'm not sure I would agree with you that the schedule drives because we're, behind schedule. So it's hard for me to, to think that, you know, I, I think we've seen a lot of staff turnover at CGI in recent months and it's it's clearly impacted the project. So I just wonder other than the bench you're creating offshore, what other solutions have you implemented to mitigate the impacts of your staff turnover? We have brought on additional resources in the um, analyst and design area. I think there were just three new resources added in that area. So there have been um, resources onboarded in the last couple of months since I've been involved with the project. And we can get you a detailed accounting of that. Please, and I'd like just sort of the, the some of maybe the, the specific structural changes that you're implementing in the long term. I think it's it's more, it's not just a question of number of folks but sort of the how, the, the why the turnover and then the solution to the turnover. So I think it's a three-part question in that regard, please. Um, and feel free, Ms. Williams, to provide, um, when this goes to the board, certainly to provide these answers to, to everyone on the board, please. And that way there's no issues of, of who's getting the information. Um, so then specifically on some of the, the pieces that I understand you're recommending, you know, one of it is this combined role item FR2 and FR3. And, you know, I think there's a lot of questions on how that impacts the budget and the schedule, but what are, and I, I wanna, I'll put a pin in that and, and let the team answer that, but what do you think the potential risks to the project of combining FR2 and FR3 could be from a quality point of view? I think there's pros and cons to the combination of FR2 and FR3. We have looked at that collectively with CalSTRS. I'll probably invite my colleague Nick to speak more to that. Um, but uh, there are scenarios in which they do not remain combined uh, and that we would implement uh, FR2 uh, much earlier than FR3. And those are models that we have discussed and presented um, and are, are collaborating with CalSTRS on. Uh, but there, there are pros and cons for both of that. And I think really Nick is probably better able to answer your question. Uh, thank you, Virginia. I think um, it's important to understand how this schedule was developed. 
Uh, this schedule was developed uh, jointly with the CalSTRS project team, um, largely uh, at their direction. And their direction is following the board's direction that the most important thing is quality. And so the schedule is long, um, longer than I would have anticipated. Um, and that is because there has been a lot of testing added throughout the process to ensure our quality. And none of that testing has been um, reduced. In fact, it's been expanded across the board. I, I don't think that combining FR2 and FR3 um, really creates uh, any more risk to end users when the system goes live. I think uh, that risk is, not, is the same as it would have been separately. Um, what this does is a different thing, is it prevents uh, the possibility that FR3 will lag FR2. And so since we were worried about the gap between FR2 and FR3, combining these two is a, is a safer answer for the, the, the working population of CalSTRS. Um, had we done uh, separate releases, um, there's a period there where the, uh, uh, the back office staff of CalSTRS would have been hard packed until FR3 came online. And by doing them together, we eliminate that period. So I don't think there's a, uh, any more risk to go live from the, the giant thing. The bigger risk is just that it takes a long time to go live. And so whenever projects start running too long, um, there is, uh, you know, it's hard to keep momentum up. I think that's the biggest risk of the combined plan. Right, okay. I just have one more question, um, Mr. Turr, and then I'll yield it. Um, so the, so what we've seen, and I think this was the point of our earlier questions a few months ago, is the continued delays and to the completion of the contractor and user acceptance testing in the in fun, FR is functional role, and I should have clarified that too. How how is that just to your point, um, Mr. Agrios, affected then the project schedule and the draft schedule that you provided in June? So I, I sort of understand your point about the trade-offs, but now I, now I want to understand kind of the point about how it actually affects the schedule. So uh, could you be a little bit more clear? I'm, are you asking about the, how so you the provided it? I'm sorry? Are you asking how the delays in the testing affect the schedule or? What's mm -hmm. the so we've had these continued delays in the completion yeah. of the contractor and user acceptance testing for FR2. Yeah. That's what we were just talking about. So I just wanna kind of specifically understand what you were saying is now the, the rollout three may surpass the rollout two. I know this is really technical. I just, now that we know for certain of these delays in the functional rollout two, how will that, how does that impact the schedule? Because you weren't clear about that in your briefing in June. What is the expected delay that you provided in June? Or is that still the schedule you believe will work? with the changes you've made? Um, the schedule we provided in June is still the, the primary schedule we're working on. That hasn't changed. Um, the, you know, obviously we've had a lot of scheduled delays that started in the, in, the, in the CAT, the contractor acceptance test, which we would also call a system test. Um, and that test is, yeah, it took, it was simply much more harder to execute than we would have thought. It was, uh, it's very difficult to create the test data conditions to execute tests in a pension system because of the duration of the data. Um, and, and so it, it, our own execution ability was um, slower than we thought it would be in the beginning. And it took a while for us to um, build the tools and techniques to accelerate our test execution. Um, I would suggest that CalSERS is finding a similar thing doing a user acceptance test which is that um, they also have projected um, execution rates and are finding that it's difficult to do that given the, uh, the complexity of generating data for tests and retests. And so it's just harder than people think um, compared to other IT systems. Um, I think that we have modeled what has happened in the past CAT and in the past UAP and those uh, models are what we use to create the schedule. And so the new dates include the time it takes um, based on actual performance, not on uh, performance that we might have uh, estimated based on other IT projects. So we, we think this is far, far more accurate and also far more conservative. Um, there, this, these are conservative parameters in the models throughout the, the planning process. So um, 
no corner is being cut to make it go faster. In fact, if anything, we're going the other way just to make sure we have uh, time and um, really time to make sure we can complete uh, all the testing in front of us. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Agrios. Uh, Ms. Millers, I'm going to uh, turn the floor over to our state controller, uh, Betty Yi. Uh, there was a request and uh, I'll ask staff that um, the series of questions that Ms. Miller has submitted to CGI and Ms. Williams has uh, stated that they've been presented, responded to those, that communication and any others that would be appropriate for the full board to have visibility into, I'll defer to staff as to what we can all see at the same time, uh, be shared with all of us so that we're all working from the same information. Thanks, Ms. Miller, for your line of questions. Let me turn it to Controller Yee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I and thank you, Ms. Miller, for uh, the questions, which I'm going to tee off of a few more, uh, if I could. Um, you know, I do. I would agree with Ms. Miller. We have uh, kind of a chicken and egg or catch twenty two issue uh, with respect to resources. I mean, we're talking about um, a draft schedule, and I guess I question, you know, just with the concerns that we have about resources, you know, the ability to meet a new timeline. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's like, I, I just feel like we're presented the situation now where we've seen kind of what's, um, you know, dragged the project um, in, uh, near, in this recent period of time. And I just would like to ask CGI um, just for a little bit more proactive, um, you know, kind of approach to this. Um, this is, um, this is, a lot of visibility for a very complex project that is very significant in terms of delivering benefits to our members to the second largest public pension fund in the United States. So um, I don't need to tell you how important it is to all of us on this board, but I hope you share that um, sentiment uh, and know that we expect a uh, full commitment relative to um, resources, relative to information um, and I, for one, feel that um, you know we've known about these um, these uh, staff resources for a while, and I think, Mr. Agrios, we've even had you come before the board on a couple of occasions, and uh, we've never had kind of a deep dive about it. So I would just ask that, as a uh, a partnership that works going forward, that um, we just are made known about what some of these challenges are and what you are doing to address them, um, because this is we, uh, I, I don't I don't know how else to kind of uh, make that clearer, but it is an expectation I think we all have finding ourselves in this situation right now. Um, you know, my, um, I do have to say, I, I'm, I'm disappointed because when I hear things like, um, you know, we ask for more testing or we, um, you know, that, you know, somehow, um, you know, kind of driving towards, you know, the quality that we, you know, demand in a system like this to deliver for our members is something extraordinary is a little troublesome to hear. Um, I would expect that that's kind of the, the commitment that all of us have to this project on both sides. And so um, I will say that I've been, um, I, I, and I'll just be upfront, I've been really disappointed. Um, this is something that I uh, hope that as we, at the board made a decision that we wanted to uh, commit to quality and knew that that would uh, cost us with respect to time, that there would be uh, an ongoing um you know, just a, a conversation about, you know, how we keep to that. And, uh, and, and the resources are very much about that. Um, so uh, I, I'm just gonna put that forth. And then um, as someone who's been around, has worked, houses, many large IT systems, I will say that, um, you know, this is one where um, it's not the most complex that the, that the state of California has, um, but it is one that, is um, certainly has its own um, set of unique um, attributes. And so I do hope that um, when you uh, work with our, continue to work with our team, that what comes forward is really not just progress, uh, but an identification of challenges and also um, uh, potential resolutions for them. Uh, I don't wanna be, you know, our oversight role as a board only goes as far as having good information. And uh, I think all of us uh, face uh, equal exposure if this doesn't proceed um, as we had contemplated uh, for a system when we uh, first embarked on this um, uh, several years ago. So uh, I'm gonna ask Mr. Chairman um, that each time we have this item agendized on, on the, before the board that we have the CGI representative. Uh, I also would like to see articulated who the CGI team is 
uh, going forward so that we're not kind of guessing where we've got gaps and, and that there are people who are accountable for various aspects of this. And uh, Ms. Williams, I appreciate you being here, Mr. Agrios. And if you are the two who are gonna be here to uh, be overseeing uh, your side of the operation of this project, um, we're happy to welcome you, but that would be my expectation. It's um, very, very tough to do oversight when we don't have information. And it's kind of a, a, a moving target for me. Um, you can talk about resources on the one hand, uh, but now we're talking about a, um, a draft schedule, which is totally tied into resources. And so I'm, I really am uh, kind of swirling at this point about just how we even conduct our oversight role without, you know, just kind of some of these uh, issues landing. And then lastly, what I will say is, uh, you know, with delays like this, I'm always very concerned about, um, you know, just how we um, continue to uh, keep, uh, you know, user confidence up. And uh, this is something that I think we all share and that um, but part of this uh, ask of you to uh, just be more forthright and to bring information forward to us is uh, in the spirit of uh, being sure that we are continuing to uh, have the highest level of confidence in what uh, will ultimately be a system that delivers for our members. Thank you, Controller Yee. Um, any response by the representative of CGI uh, specifically to the comments of Controller Yi, or uh, just processing her thoughts at this point? Uh, no spe specific comments other to, than to say that I am happy to share with the board the steps that we have taken on the resources. The pandemic aside, it is true industry-wide that the IT professionals have a variety of choices of projects that they can participate on across the nation now that there's so much work from home. So we do compete nationally now to keep our resources here and on the CalSTRS project. And it does have an impact when schedules move out and people feel as though, uh, you know, this is a longer and longer term assignment. Is it in fact enhancing my skills and building my resume? So a lot of conversations with the CalSTRS team about we need to promote within the project. If people are ready for that next jump, it does a number of good things for them, for their resume, and keeps them excited about being on this project. But I want you to know that we have gone to great lengths to keep the stability of resources on the project, including adding and offering salary increases in the tens of thousands of dollars to individuals to keep them on this project. So. You know, it has not been uh, without a lot of effort on our part to keep some stability in staff um, and to uh, continue to resource. But it's it's a hot job market, uh, and we're doing our best to compete and keep the staff uh, here. It is important, though, to know what scope is going to be included in the new schedule uh, and what is that new schedule. It will have its own staffing plan. And we absolutely are committed to staff into that schedule. I don't Could, oh. it sound like a chicken and an egg. It's not a chicken and an egg. We are anticipating what the schedule would look like and we are working with our workforce managers on that. Mr. Chairman, can I ask a question just on that issue? Of course, uh, just let us know when you want to yield the floor control. Okay, uh, I think this may be the last question and that is, um, so you're going to have a new uh, staffing plan with respect to the schedule uh, under consideration now. Um, so talk about what that transition would look like, um, because I, again, I mean, from our perspective, I have just have to say that, um, and again, this may be, this is where I'm looking at Grant Thornton to help us maybe connect the dots with respect to the, the CalSTRS staff perspective and CGI's perspective, but um, so I, I, I guess I don't know what that means, Ms. Williams, where, um, so what happens with, um, with, with the, the schedule that's in place now and the progress that continues to be made now and relative to the staffing associated with that and then the new schedule? For, for the schedule that is in place now and the, and the staffing that is in place now, we are continuing to make sure that we bring staff on to complete those obligations. Like I mentioned before, we've brought on a number of new design analysts. We've built some capacity offshore. Uh, we are putting a temporary uh, application development manager in place 
until we can find some candidates that uh, tick all the boxes for the CalSTRS team. So um, doing a lot of uh, creative things to keep the staff in for the current project and things moving forward. Okay. If I could help a little bit with the staffing plan part of it, all part of the schedule includes uh, the, the resources required to complete the tasks. And so the staffing plan lists those resources by name throughout the duration of the project. In some cases, those names are TBD where we have to bring in new people, but that's the full staffing plan. It is part and parcel of the plan. And so to avoid this chicken and egg problem, they, they go hand in hand together. They are already linked. Okay. All right. At some point, Mr. Chairman, I'd love to hear the staff perspective on that as well. Thank you. You're very welcome, controller. Turn it over to Mr. Prasad. <clears throat> uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, uh, and welcome, Ms. Williams, and your colleague whose name has just disappeared off my screen. Um, anyway, uh, there's very little I can add to what uh, uh, has been said so far and the questions that have been asked, but uh, you know, my, my simple mindedness here, uh, I look at this, uh, your, your bid on this contract, you were awarded the contract um, and we're going through the contract and you have staff problems. Uh, those staff problems uh, create, uh, you know, some timing issues. Uh, and you say you're, I, I think you said you, by the beginning of, uh, next year, uh, you're going to try to build the bench offshore. Uh, and my, my, I guess my question is, why haven't you been more aggressive in this regard earlier? And is, has it been financial? You know, has it been, I mean, you've talked about the competitiveness of getting the, the right people. And, you know, my question is, you know, you've got you've got reputational risk here as well. You've committed. You've you, you've committed to perform this agreement, mm -hmm. and so far, uh, you know, it 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 has not worked out very well. And you know, the problem I have is that my fiduciary duty is to the members, the California State educators, and you know, we've got this is one of our largest contracts. And, you know, I would think that your company would look at this and say, you know, this is the second largest pension fund in the world. Uh, the second largest, it's, it's the largest educator pension fund in the world, second largest in the United States. And, you know, we're in a state in which you've done business before. Why haven't you been more attentive and more aggressive about performing your agreement? So let me um, make sure I didn't um, uh, misspeak. The bench that we talked about offshore has already been created. Not waiting till January to do that. That's already happened. I mentioned the additional money that we put forward on salaries to prevent attrition. You know, when a member uh, at CJ comes to us and says, look, I've just been offered, you know, $20,000 more to go to another project and we are matching those offers. That is our financial commitment to this project. And we have done that uh, on many times. Sometimes it works and they stay, sometimes it doesn't. There may be something more exciting about the other project. It may have offered, offered them a promotional opportunity, whatever it is. But we have not uh, sat on our hands and not been willing to come forward in a financial respect to keep our talent on this project and to build that bench offshore. Those things are happening and have been happening now. I don't mean to interrupt you, but, but who I'm so bears sorry. that risk? I, I don't mean to interrupt you, but who bears that risk? Do we have to financially bear that risk or do you? No. But it's not our risk. She, you know, correct. It's not our risk. A, correct. Correct. They have not asked you to bear that risk. Okay. Absorbed that risk. That's my point about the fact that it hasn't been a financial uh, consideration that we have passed on to you. I just want you to be aware that we do those things and we are stepping up and we are absorbing the costs of the competitive salaries to keep people in place. Well, if I could leave you with you know the, the last thought, uh, at least from my perspective, and 
and from the other speakers so far, the other board members that have spoken so far is that uh, we expect a heck of a lot more from you. We really do. And, and it's because we have an obligation to the California educators. And this is a significant agreement in, in, in CalSTRS budget. It's a big deal to us. It may not be a big deal to you, but it is a big deal to us. And we hope you can perform a little bit better than you have. That's all I have to say, thanks. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Prasant. And um, I, I don't see any other uh, mem board members' hands that are up. Uh, I don't think much more needs to be said on our behalf. I think uh, Controller Yi, Board Member Miller from the Department of Finance, and you yourself, Mr. Prasant, have represented the concerns and questions of the board individually, collectively, quite well. I think the message is clear. Uh, I don't know if the representatives, Ms. Williams or Mr. Agrios or any members of the staff have any closing comments or thoughts that you wanna leave us with uh, before we continue with our agenda. But I wanna thank you for both being with us on screen today and uh, we will hold you to uh, your commitment to be with us uh, at future board meetings and being on screen and being accessible to the board. I'll turn it to you if any closing thoughts or comments. I can comment. I just want to make one comment that uh, we're going to be working with CGI to make sure that we understand and can and can deliver a, a resource uh, work plan that um, that demonstrates an, an achievable schedule once we get to that point. Thank you, Ms. Lucknow. Ms. Williams, Ms. Agrios, thank you for being with us today. Enjoy the weekend. Take care. Thank you. And that, con that concludes item, um, item seven, which brings us to item eight on the agenda, which is a, a continuing conversation on the LTIP. Uh, the item is pretty straightforward. We have several consultants with us, along with our outstanding head of human resources, Ms. Norcia, Melissa. Uh, we're gonna be looking to take one item and there is a recommendation before us on the one item uh, around the LTIP. And then the second part of the item is to get feedback from us. So uh, let me turn it over to Melissa. Uh, thank you, Chairperson Keeley. Um, good afternoon, Melissa Norsha, uh, Director of Human Resources. It's uh, great to be spending uh, time with all of you this afternoon and continuing our discussion on the long-term incentive uh, plan. I'm gonna keep the intro, intro short because I wanna, um, make sure we have space for discussion and feedback from all of you. Um, this item is really just built off of the feedback and uh, lessons learned from the June meeting. And I hope the board is agreeable and appreciates um, the bite-sized approach we are taking with introducing uh, the components for uh, the LTIP framework. Today, as um, Chairperson Keeley mentioned, we're gonna be covering three components. Uh, the first is the LTIP performance period. We've had discussions about what that period should be, three, four, or five. Your compensation consultant is going to uh, provide a recommendation, and we are asking for the board's consideration to take action on this one item only. Um, the next two components are information only, the participant eligibility in an LTIP, um, and then the progress with uh, cost savings measure. Again, these last two components are discussion um, and we are seeking feedback and direction from all of you. Uh, Luis Navis, your uh, primary compensation strategist could not be here with us today. Peter Landers uh, with GGA is taking the lead on this presentation along with Stephen McCourt and Alan Income from um, Makita. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Peter. You're on mute, Peter. There we go. Uh, thank you, Ms. Uh, Norcia. And uh, thank you to all the board members today. Uh, like uh, Ms. Nor Norcia had mentioned, uh, we're going to quickly uh, walk you through uh, our recommendation on a suitable performance period uh, to be covered uh, within the long-term incentive plan. We can then open it up uh, for, for any comments uh, there. And then we'll quickly uh, walk you through uh, 
some considerations around a couple of different uh, ways to think through plan eligibility in the LTIP program and some of the, uh, you know, the pros uh, of, of, of adopting one or uh, the other on the eligibility front. So on the first uh, piece, if we can flip to, uh, to slide two, uh, just quickly updating uh, the board on your board approved compensation philosophy. And this is something that you should uh, be mindful of as you think through both the performance period as well as uh, you know, your thoughts on the, uh, the eligibility front in terms of looking at, if you recall, uh, back in June, uh, we ran a compensation study that uh, following this philosophy looked at uh, the approved peer groups, looked at uh, where you were positioned uh, against those peer groups, and noted from a total compensation uh, perspective some gaps uh, to the market. And again, that is to the median of the market, so the midpoint of the market, not uh, not above that. So just a, a reminder of that. If we can flip to the next slide, please. Um, we really, you know, tossed this back and forth, thought through the most common performance periods that we see when organizations have adopted long-term incentives really range uh, between three and five years. Uh, and when we thought through a variety of different considerations and thought through, you know, Calster specific and needs if you are to uh, embark and approve a long-term incentive in the future. Uh, we found that five years was uh, the right period. And the reason we say that is it really reflects a longer term time period uh, to measure those investment performance and cost savings results. So it is aligning with that view of you know, tying to the longer term performance of the fund uh, it also aligns with a, uh, a timeline that you're already collecting and analyzing a performance on because uh, you currently look at one, three, five, and 10 years. And while we note that five years is definitely on the higher end or the longer end of the spectrum, it is still a, a timeline that is measured and included in these types of, of programs. And as well, uh, with some of you also uh, having experience working on the CalPERS board, it also aligns uh, with you know a five-year time frame uh, that they are looking at, and so it's a length of time that you should be comfortable with analyzing uh, investment performance and potentially cost savings uh, under the plan as well. So those are the, sort of the key uh, reasons why we're coming forward with the recommendation of a five-year uh, performance period measuring against long-term results, aligns with how you already track things and should be you know, quite comfortable and in line with uh, general market practice. So maybe I'll, I'll stop there and if there are any comments on this recommendation, happy to, uh, to answer them. Thank you, Mr. Landers. If we could drop the slides at this point. Thank you. Any questions or comments about the recommendation of the five-year time period? Okay. We've been swimming in these waters for a long time, so we're familiar with this. Uh, let me go to Ms. Hendricks. I, I was just curious if, if Alan and Stephen could just comment on their experience advising other <clears throat> pension funds and kind of what your sense is in terms of length of time and what you've seen with other LTIP. Uh, Steve, Steve McCourt, uh, Makita. Um, not a large number of our clients uh, have long-term uh, incentive plans, but um, the uh, the ones that uh, do five years is um, the the common uh, time frame. Thank you, Steve. Any other questions? If not, uh, Ms. Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is really more for perhaps for staff. Um, that was really helpful, Mr. McCourt. I don't know if um, Mr. Aylman is potentially on. It's just in terms of how kind of just in terms of the historic fund performance for 2021, how do we believe in additional in incentives will generate improved investment returns beyond the work currently being done? And um, Mr. Ailman, I'm going to ask you kind of specifically to talk about pre and post PEPRA, just because I don't know that any, everyone has the benefit of understanding this, and it's obviously just for the investment side. And if you could also just share kind of your retention 
and attrition statistics, just so I, we kind of level set on those. I think both of those pieces of information could be really helpful for the team. Um, and then I'll ask the same of the, of Ms. Of, um, Ms. Norsha as well, just in terms of, of how, how five years seems to work and, and what perhaps, it, maybe I won't even have you answer that question today, Ms. Norsha, because I think it has more to do with what metrics we set. But for you, Mr. Ailman, if you don't mind answering that today, please. Sure. Uh, you know, I would have to say our primary focus has been three years because that's what's used in the actuarial smooth. Um, we think out to five years because we think long term. In terms of how does this uh, incentivize or change the return profile for staff? Uh, the one thing I'll say, uh, when we first started the incentive program, I was truly surprised at how focused the staff was. You know, most of us being in government, um, we might have come from an incentive system, but we knew, like for myself, when I started, there wasn't one present. Um, but it's highly motivated the staff uh, to focus in on those objectives and those goals of beating their benchmarks. Adding this because it's five years, um, you know, I think what it, it, it already emphasizes because we have a three year smooth, you need to beat your benchmarks year in and year out. You can't just have one smashing year and then walk away. Um, and five years means you got to be really consistent all the time. You can't have uh, much of a down period. So uh, I think if anything, it just rewards again, long-term thinking, which was important to us. Uh, to me, the, the key to this uh, benefit or this incentive is retention. Uh, your question about PEPRA, um, I ran through the statistics uh, with HR uh, right now, about, uh, I don't have it off the top of my head, actually, unfortunately, I didn't write it down. I print it, didn't print it. 43% uh, of the associate portfolio managers are in the uh, PEPRA program, meaning that they don't have a traditional defined benefit plan. Uh, they have to work much longer uh, in terms of age uh, in order to qualify for that plan, and you have a reduced benefit. Um, so, you know, within the the portfolio, it's anybody that's been hired since 2013. Why that's important to us is the collaborative model really only started a few years ago. And the, the, all these recent hires, even the ones that Makita talked about yesterday in private equity that they're so impressed with, are all people who are not coming here, say, for the traditional divine benefit plan. Uh, and the thing I would emphasize, you know, with a five-year period, this plan's not going to start for five years. This plan is not really being designed and, and isn't going to show its value to the fund for the baby boomers because they're going to retire. It's really going to show its benefit for that group we've hired now in the last five years. We want them to stick around when we get to 2026, 20, 2027, 20, 2030. 20, um, so it's uh, uh, about 40% of the associate portfolio managers, I believe it drops to 35% of the portfolio managers right now, about a third are in EPRA versus the traditional defined benefit. Uh, the director's levels, and, and obviously Scott and I are long-term people, uh, but for the directors, basically uh, one of them right now is in PEPRA. So I look at this as a future way to, to add to that retention um, of the staff. Hopefully that answers your questions. Yeah, that's super helpful, um, especially the kind of the distinction of the benefit of a defined benefit plan and those that don't actually have the same benefit. I think that's a really kind of California specific data point that's that's important as we consider this. I do just just sort of speaking about the success yesterday of, of where we are in terms of our portfolio. You do have an incredibly low retention rate. It's about five and a half percent, according just in the investment side. So I, I do as much as I think. LTV Turnover rate. I just want to be clear. Retention rate's 95%. 95, excuse me, attrition rate. Sorry. Yes, that was a very good correction. Um, but I, I do think it, it shows the strength of your team, which I, as we have these conversations around LTIP and what we need to look at more, salary is only one consideration. And I do think this becomes kind of an enterprise wide question, of course, but I, you know, you're, you're, maybe a victim of your success, but I think it's why the, the pre and post pepper question becomes so important when we look at LTIP rather than just sort of as an exercise, a theoretical exercise, actually understanding kind of the what and the how is really important. So I appreciated that explanation. Thanks, Ms. Miller. Uh, I see Controller Yee. 
question. Just a real quick question, um, Harry, and that is, uh, Mr. Chair, just want to be sure that um, there were no changes um, being suggested to the percentage payouts that were presented previously that's, in our meeting. That's, that's correct. correct. The only okay. issue, of course, is uh, the, the five the period, years. the yes. performance period. Okay, thank you. Okay, seeing no other hands, um, there is a recommendation for a five year period to the LTIP. Uh, if we get to the point where we actually fully get to the LTIP, this is the first step in the process, getting to a consensus around the five year period, uh, retention, long termism. Is there a recommendation or a, a motion to approve the recommendation? Mr. Chair, I'll, I'll uh, move to approve the five year performance period for Thank purposes you. of the LTIP. Thank you. Controller Yee, is there a second? I'll second it. Seconded by Mr. Prasant. Any dis further discussion? Seeing none, uh, Ms. Uh, Yamanat, would you please take? Sure, I'm on that. Uh, Ms. Bradford? Yes. Ms. Hendricks? Yes. Ms. Ika? Yeah. Mr. Prasant? Yes. Ms. Erden? Yes. Ms. Yamamoto? Aye. Ms. Miller? Aye. Mr. Rufino? Yes. Mr. Johnson? Yes. Controller Yee? Aye. Chairperson Keeley, would you care to vote? Yes. The motion passes. Thank you. Next uh, portion of this item has to do with uh, really providing guidance and feedback, our thoughts on two areas of the LTIP. Uh, the purpose is really not for us to get to consensus or conclusion on either one of these items today. So please keep that in mind. This is not a finish line. This is just throwing some our own individual thoughts and ideas to the consultant. So as they go back to continue to work on these items, they'll have our thinking on it. Uh, certainly not the end of our thinking. It's really the, uh, a continuation of the dialogue. So uh, don't feel as if we need to get to any uh, consensus views. Uh, if there is some, it will then we'll, it will surface. If it doesn't, that's okay for today. So let me turn it back uh, to you, Melissa, and uh, and and, and uh, the consultants that are with us. Yeah, actually, I'll just have uh, Peter if you could just come back on screen, and maybe we can um, Jonathan if we could put the presentation back up. Thank you. Great. Yeah, if we can flip to the next slide, please. Awesome. So just as a bit of background and, you know, as part of the deliberations, what we've done is tried to summarize uh, for the board here uh, the general eligibility that we see uh, in terms of long-term incentives when we look at uh, the roles that are under your uh, setting authority. So the first, that middle column is really looking at in the broader uh, peer group, uh, what are the, the general, you know, eligibility and check marks basically mean it's quite prevalent. Mixed means, you know, it's some organizations do it, some organizations don't. And typically not eligible uh, obviously means those types of roles are not eligible. And then what we've done, just for reference, is, you know, the closest sort of geographic up here, uh, looking at CalPERS, who is, you know, definitely uh, in the U.S. pension fund space, uh, you know, moving the needle on the LTIP portion. Just providing for your reference, their current uh, eligibility uh, framework. So just so you have that as you're thinking through uh, and we talk about this sort of broader uh, approach to eligibility in the LTIP or a narrower uh, approach uh, to eligibility in the LTIP. And I think it's important to realize that within your board approved peer group, which is a mixture of US pension funds, some Canadian funds, as well as some uh, private sector uh, sponsors, when you look at LTIP, it's currently in place at the Canadian funds and CalPERS and at private sector peers. And it's generally not in place at most other US pension fund peers. So it is important to realize you would be in the US pension fund space, uh, a bit of a, a leader uh, on this uh, initiative, but definitely in the broader marketplace, when you look at pension funds outside of the US, you look at the private sector, these are, you know, this is the type of program that is typically in place for the types of roles that you are recruiting for and looking to retain uh, to be successful under the collaborative model. So I just wanted to, uh, to highlight that uh, for the group here. If we can uh, move to the next slide, please. So when we think of a broader eligibility for long-term incentives, so having more people uh, in the program, there are some key things to consider as rationale for why you might do this. 
One is it would be reflective of your board approved philosophy, which looks for, you know, looks to be externally competitive and to be internally equitable uh, for similar types of rules. It also would align with the labor market analysis that uh, you would have seen back in June, which said that from a total compensation perspective, the lack of LTIP is uh, positioning CalSTRS for many rules below the median uh, of, of your board approved peer group. This is a key one, this third piece, the, the idea of one team and the need to have one team that is critical to the success of the collaborative model. So it goes beyond just the investment staff that obviously are in the front office and doing the deals, but it strikes on the importance of some of the non-investment staff, the investment services folks who of course support uh, the investment team and who are doing a lot of really complicated and increased uh, deal flow transactions uh, when compared to the general marketplace. And it also looks at you know, that executive management staff that also play a critical role to the success of uh, the collaborative model in the longer term performance of the fund. So that's something that you know having more people involved uh, helps with that. It obviously recognizes the need to attract and retain high performing talent, both on the executive management side and investment services side, along with your front office staff. And it will allow for you know, minimal changes to eligibility in the future, which will provide more consistency. And therefore you won't be seeing in the future any sort of potential rises, uh, you know, two material rises in your potential LTIP costs. So that's, you know, if you're thinking through reasons why you might want to do a broader LTIP eligibility, these are the types of considerations, along with some of the uh, comments that Mr. Ailman uh, would have made earlier around the need to retain and, you know, make sure you're taking into account the people that might be in PEPRA that don't have uh, as, as good of a uh, pension uh, promise in the future. And those younger staff that you're looking to build uh, throughout the organization from that associate portfolio manager, portfolio manager level up into more senior levels over the next few years. So that's some rationale for broader uh, LTIP eligibility. If we flip to the next slide, please. Uh, two of the, the most common reasons we see uh, for a narrower or a more targeted uh, eligibility uh, to start off is obviously naturally would keep potential uh, LTIP costs lower at the start of the program. So it would give you time to see how the plan plays out, uh, how much you know, you're having to spend on this uh, LTIP uh, initiative. So it gives you that time to really see if it's working or not. And it is important to realize that you know, given our years and years of experience working with uh, pension funds that have adopted these types of, of programs, is not all of them have gone sort of, you know, everyone uh, uh, participates up front. Uh, there are definitely a lots of examples of funds that have started with that more narrower approach, focusing on the most sort of senior executives like the CEO position and then investment staff professionals. And then over time, they have uh, started to include other, uh, well, I'll, for lack of a better term, other executive management rules or investment service type roles over time. So this is something that there would be historical uh, context and practice of doing that. Um, and so those are probably the two most common and uh, most uh, sort of strong rationales for why you might uh, want to follow a narrower uh, approach to eligibility. If we can flip to the next slide, please. Uh, the next two slides are really just looking at potential. And again, we can do uh, lots of variations uh, of these, but this gives you a sense through the check marks of the types of roles that would generally participate in a broader uh, LTIP program. So you can see there's a lot more check marks in this table. And then if we uh, go to the next slide, please, you can see under a narrower approach, it would be more targeted at mostly just the investment staff. Uh, typically a CEO would also uh, participate in this type of program, but you can see uh, some of the differences uh, if you go with a narrower or a broader approach uh, to the eligibility. And again, these are just potential. Uh, we can do iterations of this, uh, of course, uh, when we get down you know, in future sessions, in future meetings uh, to, to define this further. And then if we follow to uh, the next slide, please. You know, in our view, and this is just you know, our view as uh, your compensation consultant, 
we generally uh, like the broader uh, approach. We really uh, believe that you know it is critical to uh, not only, of course, incent your investment uh, professionals, but also the critical uh, teams that are also supporting uh, the investment team on those uh, on those deals, on all the different investments, and also to the executive management team, who are also very important in terms of you know overseeing things and making sure longer term uh, that you're aligning uh, with performance. And again, it also will align you uh, with your compensation philosophy of making sure that you're aligning your executive, but also your uh, investment talent uh, with the median of your board approved peer group. And again, I go back to the June study that showed uh, there were some gaps, obviously larger for investment uh, professionals, but there were still gaps observed uh, to the median for your executive management and investment services staff. And so a broader eligibility would allow you to uh, align to that median through an incentive uh, that is at risk, that is longer term in nature, that won't pay out for several years, as opposed to trying to uh, fill that uh, potential gap with increased salary, which isn't at risk, or an annual incentive that you're paying out on an annual uh, basis. So with that, I'll, I'll conclude uh, our uh, our talk on this, and I open this up to any questions or comments uh, from the board. Thank you, Mr. Landers. If we could drop the slides. Thank you. We'll open it up to the committee for your views on a narrower approach or a broader approach to uh, eligibility as an initial conversation. We'll start with uh, Ms. Miller and then Ms. Higa and then Controller Yee. I'm happy to go after everyone else, Mr. Chair. I Great, so what else? thank you, Ms. Miller. Very, very kind of you. Uh, Ms. Higa. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, uh, and thank you, Gail. Um, I, I just, I, a couple of questions. Um, I, uh, I, I wonder if you could just help me understand the um, the thinking behind um, distinguishing within the investment staff between think what you've got described as front office. So that's the you know the the, the staff within the asset classes that are sort of doing the deals and and um, negotiating potentially the, the some of the co investment or collaborative model opportunities. Um, and distinguishing them from the investment services staff. You know, I, I understand that those investment services staff may not be participating in, um, you know, uh, making deals, um, finding deals, um, negotiating, but I think that they still play a critical part and, you know, potentially even a, even sort of a, a greater role um, given um, the new type of um, responsibility and activity we're taking on with the collaborative model. Um, so could you um, just maybe provide some, some insight on that, Peter? Happy to. Um, one, one thing I will point out is uh, part of it comes down to market prevalence. And so when I said there's mixed prevalence in the marketplace, uh, there are some pension funds that have a broad approach and that will incent both what will, for lack of better terms, front office and investment services staff both under uh, an LTIP program. And there are others uh, that choose to limit that to uh, just the investment staff itself. So market prevalence wise, uh, that is why, you know, we consider, you know, under a broader approach, you include them under a narrower, you may not, but again, you could make, uh, you know, an iteration of that and include investment services staff and maybe not other roles. Uh, but, when you look at uh, general market practice, it tends to be a mixed practice, and that's why we delineate uh, between uh, the two. Definitely will not argue that the investment services staff are playing a critical role uh, in supporting and in aiding uh, the front office staff as well. And I think that's a, a debate that this board uh, should have is, do we want to uh, delineate between the two, or do we want to you know, make sure that were, you know, from an eligibility perspective, uh, being internally equitable between that front office staff and the investment services staff. But yes, market prevalence wise, it, it can be mixed 
uh, from from organization to organization. And I guess the perspective that I'd share is that um, it, you know when we've been talking about the potential LTIP, um, there have been a lot of considerations that have kind of overlapped and gotten mixed in this. You know, to some extent, you know, people are looking back at the market survey that showed that there were some gaps with market competitiveness. So that's a rationale for the LTIP. There's sort of, you know, um, uh, you know, retention or ability to um, attract new staff that we need to be successful with the collaborative model. Um, you know, there's looking at what our peers or our competitors are doing. So, so a number of different um, considerations. And I, and I guess, um, you know, what, what I would offer is that at least as we're thinking about eligibility, I, I do think it's important um, to think about who is contributing to our success with the collaborative model. And I, and I think, um, you know, both sides of the house, if you will, um, within the investment team, um, you know, front office and investment services, the, the deal makers and the deal doers, you know, or what, you know, that's probably a bad term, but whatever term you might use um, are, are important to consider. Um, because I, when I step back and think about it, um, you know, I, I, I think a core reason why we were considering this is because of the way in which um, the, the fund is evolving and the kind of staff that we need and want to retain, attract and retain is evolving because of the collaborative model. And I think it's important to um, remember that when we're considering eligibility. So that's just some of my, my input. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Ms. Higa. Controller Yee. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, a similar uh, question, although this is more relating to the delineation between um, investment staff and executive staff. And um, didn't know if you had uh, maybe a little bit more uh, color or background around the uh, practice of um, the depth of the executive staff that are eligible for LTIP uh, uh, outside of the CEO. Okay, so uh, definitely when we look at uh, the prevalence um, in the marketplace, um, you know, CFOs, COOs, you know, those type of roles, uh, the more senior roles tend to be probably more prevalent. There's still a mixed practice, but they tend to participate a little bit more. I would say when you get into general counsel, system actuary uh, type of roles, those roles tend to be you know, mixed, there's still some prevalence, but probably a little bit less than a CFO or a COO uh, type role. So I'll delineate a little bit uh, there as well. Um, and then, and it really then comes down to, you know, the makeup of different funds and the different executive roles that they might have in addition to that. But I would say roles like CFO, COO, CEO um, tend to be probably the most prevalent uh, executive roles outside of CIO. Uh, that tend to participate in these types of plans. And the other ones uh, are probably a little bit less prevalent, but still show some, uh, some eligibility uh, within funds. Uh, okay. So hopefully that answers your question, but happy yeah. to clarify if you need any more. No, I, I appreciate that. Um, I, I, I guess, and, and I, I like this whole notion that, you know, we are thinking about kind of the one team concept in terms of what's critical for uh, the success of the collaborative model. Um, uh, but I guess in terms of, I guess, how LTIP generally has been um, you know, discussed, it's always been based on um, kind of investment performance and returns. And so uh, it's kind of like, you know, how far do you kind of reach out in the organization and, and, and will vary, I'm sure, from fund to fund, depending on uh, just the structure, but um, just wanted to kind of get a, a sense of that. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. Yee. Ms. Harden. Thank you. Um, I, I have one question as we think about um, broader. Um, one is, do we, will the metrics definitely be the same as they would be for the investment team? Or do you see cases where the metrics for the broader organization have other uh, components to it that reflect the broader roles? And just to kind of help think about, in general, I'm very in favor of aligning the one team with our objectives, with our compensation. I also recognize the forward-looking aspect of it, the tremendous performance that we've shown and what it really takes to do that. And that these are skilled positions. Um, but then as we think about, so how, how broad is the one team? 
Um, do we bind it simply by thinking about the investment results or do we potentially brought in those factors and what have you seen other places? Great, uh, great question, uh, Ms. Rodon. I will say that, you know, a typical, uh, typically those sort of individual metrics and considerations uh, tend to be more focused on those annual incentive plans. And obviously like the CalSTRS uh, board sort of delineates and has a higher weighting on investment performance for investment staff and less weighting on investment for you know the management staff that is that is typically where these things are often delineated typically long-term incentive plans are focused on the same metric for everyone that participates in the plan um, that doesn't mean we couldn't be unique and create a plan that uh, that would do that but in terms of aligning with market practice the the typical long-term incentive plan in the marketplace looks at longer term investment results um, and so typically anyone participating would participate with that same goal of driving investment results in Calster's case, potentially will be including cost savings as well under the collaborative model, but it has everyone working together on those, you know, common team or total fund uh, objectives that would be uh, most common in the marketplace uh, for sure. Thank you. And may I ask one separate question as well? Of course. Great, thank you, Harry. Um, thank you, that's very helpful. Um, and then as we look at um, our peer group, if you could just remind me or remind us uh, whether we've differentiated within that, those that really are executing the collaborative models. Since we really are leaders with this, you pointed out those that do it, but it's a, it's a small universe doing it in the public fund world. So yeah, is that so, the that we're looking at, or does it also include the other large plans that may not be doing what we're doing at this time? So I, I can speak at a higher level and say that you have, I think, been focusing on more leading uh, funds. Uh, that's why you've included some of the leading Canadian funds. Uh, you've included some of the largest um, U.S. pension funds, most of which I think are dabbling in the collaborative model. I know as part of setting the peer group, uh, part of the statistics that are looked at is the percentage of assets that are internally managed uh, within the peer group. And I know that that percentage is quite high. Uh, we're talking, I think, on median a 50% plus, I think, if my memory serves me correctly. And so I think you are uh, measuring within that, you know, peer group universe against, you know, funds that are, uh, maybe not all of them are at the same level of internal management that you are but uh, a lot of them are, you know, moving in that direction, have made large strides. If we think of, you know, groups like uh, Wisconsin, uh, you know, Oregon doing some, some interesting things. CalPERS, of course, bringing more in-house. And there's a variety of other uh, examples as well uh, within the peer group. But yes, I think you have tried within that peer group as best as possible to be comparing to uh, the more of the, the leading edge uh, of funds in both the U.S. and considering Canada as well. Great, thank you. I'm sorry. May I be? May I ask one final one that spurred that, or should we move on? And no, come back? please do. The purpose of this is for us to provide our thinking on uh, eligibility. So please do, Jennifer. Great, thank you. My, and this is my my sense. So I really look to the experts to tell us is that I mean, comp, comp plans have a forward looking element to them, and so. My sense is that the trends um, have been, but let me turn it around as a question. Do you see trends among those that you see as our peer group and keeping us in the range that, might, that we might consider um, as to how likely the universe is, like, is going to have this on kind of a forward-looking basis or have the potential for it as we think about the competition for talent and wanting to reward talent? For, for excellent performance and aligned with our objectives. Uh, I'll comment on the compensation piece and then potentially Stephen or Alan can speak about the investment uh, strategy piece of it. But um, essentially what we're seeing is definitely uh, more and more funds, especially in the US, at least starting to look at uh, the idea of LTIP. Obviously CalPERS has already adopted it. You at CalSTRS are currently deliberating 
uh, on it. We've seen other uh, organizations uh, tying in, you know, three and five year uh, performance into uh, their incentive programs. So looking at that longer term uh, performance. And I think this is something that uh, as organizations, and I can speak even to uh, the Canadian funds that we've worked with and are currently working with, as they are looking to, to bring more investing in house, they are increasingly having conversations around, you know, putting in long term incentive plans so that they can ensure that they are able to attract and retain the type of talent they want uh, in this consideration. If you were, you know, passively managed, continued to be sort of outsourced, I think we would be having a totally different conversation, may not even be talking about an LTIP. But I think given the direction you're going, uh, we are seeing a lot of organizations uh, that are, you know, having the conversations around how do we best attract and retain the talent that we want uh, to execute on, you know, things like the collaborative model and bringing those costs down by bringing, you know, private equity and, uh, you know, some of those more uh, non-liquid uh, asset classes uh, more internally uh, and having them more internally managed. But I'll speak to Stephen and Alan who can maybe talk about investment strategy trends uh, more than I can. Before, yeah, I, I don't, I don't, I don't think we need to go further into that. Okay. Yeah. The response yeah. on that. I think that was, was that enough? Uh, certain? That was exactly what I was asking. No, trends from a compensation standpoint, oh, okay. recognizing okay. what our strategy is. So thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. Very helpful. So we have uh, two other board members that want to speak to this issue. Certainly if, if you have thoughts or questions about eligibility after the meeting, and some of us will, we reach out to Peter directly. So, um, keeping the time in mind and that this is simply informational at this point, we're not taking action. Uh, let's be mindful of the time, but I want to get to Ms. Yamamoto and then Ms. Miller, you'll finish out the, uh, this portion of it. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Some of my questions are just, just really comments. Um, just, just for the record, I am the all for one team. Um, and then also I wanted to ask about the investment performance. Um, so, is, you know, this may be, may, may be a premature question, but when the percentage of the LTIP or the, the incentive that is provided to the, to the staffs, does that depend on an each ACID class's um, targets or is it just a total percentage of the performance itself? And then also um, when that incentive is awarded, because we are a state agency, are we, um, I know that it's not part of the salary, but is it, it's, it's kind of like a, a, like a DBS kind of a thing for teachers, then it's, it's not, is that considered part of their uh, retirement um, salary? So are, are we restricted? because we are a state agency or not. So just some things that I've been thinking about and, and wondering about, but maybe it is a premature question for, for today's information. I'll, I'll defer to the, the chair. Uh, I can answer that question, but if we wanna keep it on just eligibility, I can. No, do please do Ms. Landers as, as concisely as you can. Thank you. Perfect. So uh, the idea would be currently, and again, we haven't approved anything and we'll be bringing this back for a future discussion. The idea is to have more of an absolute rate of return that must be hit over the five years. So it would be a percentage for the total fund. So it wouldn't be about necessarily beating benchmark, but beating an absolute uh, return. And okay. uh, I'll, I'll give you my thinking on the, the pension thing, but uh, Ms. Norcia might be able to confirm. But my understanding is similar to the annual incentive. Any long-term incentive would not be pension eligible, similar to the annual incentive. So it's not meant to add on to their pension, uh, their pension uh, obligation that would be owed to them. Thank you, Ms. Calanders. Uh, the screen is kind of being a little acting up. <laughs> Ms. Miller. Yamamoto, were you done? Yeah. I, I yeah. Thought, oh, I thought I I'm saw sorry. you. I'm sorry. I'm done. I'm sorry. Okay. I'm done. 
Thank you. Thank you, Thanks. Mr. Chair. Um, so I have three really brief sort of points for future consideration, Mr. Chair. One, um, on this one team approach, I, I never wanna lose sight that we're also part of a state team. So we talk about CalSTRS as though it's not kind of all together. I, I do think it's really important to consider these positions at other state departments. It's, it's where I continue to think, uh, Mr. Landers, we could just use a little bit more forward-looking information in terms of what the state looks like writ large. And so I, I think we, we both wanna be separate and together with the state and that comes with benefits and disadvantages. And I, I do think that's a level of analysis we haven't done. And that's why the, the allowances in statute are, are stronger for the investment team. And I think the work and the data the investment team has put together in terms of retention and attrition, I think is important, is important that we do enterprise wide because CalSTRS, you know, at 5% attrition is better than almost any other state department. So I, I, I'd like to just be mindful of those data points because I, I do think we continue not to look at those. And obviously, when when there are when we don't meet the seven percent, or when there is a budget surplus, just being part of the greater state conversation, I think, is always an important one. And so, I'd like to be mindful of that too. I, I think the points that Mr. Ailman was making about pre and post PEPRA, and this speaks to Ms. Yamamoto's concerns about how the pe pension funds are are limited at a, at a fairly high amount as to what is PERS eligible. And then obviously feeds into retirement, as we all know, long term. But I, I think that's a really interesting point that when we look at a comp plan as forward looking, what what the benefits are and are not for certain for certain folks, I think, is is always an important piece. And that's another data point I'd like in terms of of our analysis. And then the third point in terms of analysis, I think we're clear kind of on the metrics and the measures that we'd use for our investment team. I would agree with Ms. Higa in, in terms of, of what the investment team is and is not. But if in fact we're, we're looking at one team, it, it would make sense to me that, that the, then the metrics are, whether it's something like the pension solutions plan or other parts of the enterprise that actually have to be well-functioning in order for the reason we're doing the collaborative model to work. So I, I don't know that, a, that then if we're making this an enterprise-wide project that it shouldn't, we shouldn't have metrics that apply to different parts of the enterprise and make everyone work together on more than just the investment. So that's sort of the third piece I'd like to look at in terms of the metrics, because I think we're taking a sliver of CalSTRS and then applying it system-wide versus looking at the whole system and applying it to the LTIP. So those, and uh, Mr. Landers and Mr. Chair, happy to work on these as we go forward. But those are the three pieces of information I continue to think are lacking and appreciate that we're a leader in, in this, um, in terms of the nationwide pension funds. Would like just a little bit more detail around that. What, who are the leaders? What do they look like? And then um, we'll continue to work with Makita on kind of what the metrics are how to measure them and then with Mr. Landers on what other metrics we can use. So all forward looking, because I know we're running short on time, Mr. Chair. Thank, thank you very much, Ms. Miller and concur with all of your concerns and questions raised. I uh, appreciate everyone's thoughts uh, and some direction, one team approach uh, versus a narrower approach. Again, this was just a preliminary conversation to give Peter uh, and the folks at his group some, some of our thinking on the topic of eligibility. The third aspect of this conversation uh, this afternoon will be uh, with Steve McCourt and Alan Emkin from Makita. Just as from a time perspective, uh, I'm looking at probably, we'll probably go not with this item, hopefully we'll get through this sooner, but we'll take a break at about three o'clock, no matter where we are in the agenda. We'll break for uh, 30 minutes. We'll take a 30 minute break from three to 3.30 which means we'll have been meeting for two straight hours. So from three to 3.30, and then hopefully we come back and have about an hour left from 3.30 to 4.30 and be done by 4.30 this afternoon. Just gives you some thinking on how I like the agenda to flow. Stephen and Alan. Great, um, thank you, Chair Keeley. Uh, and we'll be fairly uh, brief. We only have one slide in the presentation um, just relating to um, our uh, role in all of this, which is to help CalSTRS think through the appropriate way to measure the cost savings uh, from the, the collaborative model. 
Uh, the current timeline is that our intention is, is to present our recommendation to the board in, uh, in November. So this is just an update on the early work um, that we've uh, done in this. Uh, our current thinking is that um, in measuring the cost savings from the collaborative model, uh, the most important thing to recognize is that uh, the definition of what is collaborative and what is not collaborative is a slippery thing. It's hard to decide which specific investment is collaborative and which is not. They all fall on some sort of spectrum. Um, so instead of um, debating uh, the merits of uh, individual uh, transactions uh, and investments that Calsters makes, we thought a better approach was to take the broadest measure of cost savings uh, that uh, are generated by the CalSTRS investment staff through a wide variety of activities that could be considered uh, collaborative. These would be co-investing, um, separate account investments and joint ventures in the private market investment areas, it could be internally managing uh, global equity fixed income and currency strategies, or negotiating um, CalSTRS wide uh, fee rebates uh, based on utilizing strategies across multiple asset classes. Uh, anyone could debate whether any one of these is collaborative or not, but certainly in the whole, they represent uh, the full amount of uh, cost savings that accrues to CalSTRS uh, as a consequence of staff uh, engaging in the investment world uh, in a way that in some way disintermediates uh, the asset management industry from uh, the full assortment of fees that most normal investors have to, um, to pay. Once we have that full uh, calculation of the savings, uh, the holistic savings from the investment program, uh, the next step is to set benchmarks or thresholds on how much that saving should increase in each and every year. And so what I wanna highlight is there's a lot that staff has done historically to create significant amount of savings within the investment program vis-a-vis -vis other models they could use to invest uh, your capital. Uh, but what's important, uh, we think, in terms of the collaborative model uh, and the elevation of that model in the future is making sure that the amount of fee savings that's being generated increases each and every year. So um, the, the, the pace of that increased savings of asset management fees, uh, we think is a, is a good metric um, to use uh, to determine the effectiveness with which the collaborative model is being executed, um, which is why you're focusing um, on this. So we'll have much more in November on the specific um, modeling and calculation of these fee savings. But for now, we just wanted to address the, the general framework and thought process and Happy to answer any questions or take any feedback that uh, any any board members might have. Thanks, Mr. McCourt. Concise, very clear, straightforward, and helpful from my perspective. Any uh, and a sneak pre preview as to what they'll be bringing to us in November. Any questions or thoughts for uh, Ms. Erden? Thank you. And this is terrific. The one thing, and it's it's the obvious thing as you go through it, is just thinking through the intended and unintended impacts that we might have in terms of how uh, we decide to measure this. And seeing that, you know, that the kind of devil in the detail of the metric is fully aligned with what we're seeking to do so that staff is indifferent in terms of what the right investments are um, for the long run for CalSTRS while still able to earn um, incentive LTIP if that's indeed approved. Thank you. Thank you. We look forward to uh, more details on this in, in November. Thanks very much, Mr. McCord and Ms. Danikin. Okay. Good afternoon. Take care. Uh, next item on the agenda is item nine. And this is uh, the proposed the first peak of the 2022-2023 operating budget. And we have Ms. Underwood with us, our Chief Financial Officer. Good afternoon. Afternoon, thank you, Chair Keeley and members of the board. Again, I'm Julie Underwood, Chief Financial Officer, and I'm presenting the operating budget concepts. 
for fiscal year 22-23. So first I wanted to begin with a reminder of what's occurred over the previous two budget cycles. So at the beginning of the pandemic, the state requested that we reduce spending. So we voluntarily withdrew our board approved 2021 budget change proposal, which included 27 positions and 4.8 million to fund the JLL property management contract increase for our existing headquarters and increases for technology expenditures. And as a result, we had to reassess our priorities and workload. Then for the next budget cycle for 21-22, the state's directives to mitigate costs continued. So we just focused on adding resources to support the collaborative model to manage more assets internally, which is a cost reduction initiative. In addition, pursuant to the state's directives to obtain operational efficiencies, our operating budget was permanently reduced by 2.4 million, which again required us to reassess our priorities and workload. Now for this upcoming budget cycle for 22-23, the state has requested that we continue with the same budget resiliency that helped the state through the pandemic and that we focus on maintaining our current service levels for existing services only. So this will be the third budget cycle that we've been asked to limit our budgetary requests. So we continue evaluating our long-term operational resource needs and our strategic objectives across the organization. And so our request is limited to resources and funding for concepts and contracts that have previously been reviewed with and approved by the board for existing operational needs. <clears throat> so that gets us to our proposed 22-23 operating budget. So if you could please turn to item nine, page nine. Now this shows a summary of the concepts and other budgetary changes that reflect a net estimated increase to the operating budget in the amount of 49.8 million. Now that's comprised of 24.9 million to fund the most recent JLL contract amendment that was approved by the board back in January of this year for property management services for the CalSTRS headquarters. And it includes the expansion once it's completed. Now I should mention 13.5 million of that amount is for one-time costs for capital and third-party tenant improvements and decommissioning infrastructure on future tenant floors once the expansion is completed and we can begin leasing out the floors in our existing headquarters. Then we're also asking for 5.8 million for technology capabilities. Now IT costs continue to increase for ongoing platforms and tools, including software renewals and teleworking solutions. Now increasing IT costs were previously discussed with the board back in November, 2019, as part of that withdrawn BCP and these costs continue to rise. And we wanna ensure that we keep our software updated and we protect against security risks to ensure our quality of services to our stakeholders. And I should mention that this increase is not related to any large scale enterprise wide IT projects, including the pension solution project. This is just for ongoing IT needs. Then we're also asking for 1.7 million and that is for 10 out of those 27 positions that the board had originally approved through the 2021 withdrawn BCP. Now we evaluated our needs based on the state's current directive and determined that 10 positions across six business areas are critical to maintain ongoing information security and operational support activities. Now detail for each position is provided in appendix one. And again, these are the same positions discussed with the board when they were originally approved back in November, 2019. Now the remaining budget increase of 17.4 million is primarily associated with non-discretionary expenditures. And that's for wage, escalation, wage escalation, uh, pro rata assessment increases for central administrative services paid to the state and includes the year two expenditures for the multi-year internal investment management plan that the board approved back in November, 2020 to support the collaborative model. So those are the main concepts that we plan to incorporate into the final budget that will be presented to you in November. Now there are also a few items that we're still monitoring that we may or may not need to include. And that is for the pension solution and the headquarters expansion projects. You know, as you know, the delays in those projects, they may require additional funding. And as soon as that's determined, we will evaluate and provide updates to you. 
Now, we also received a state budget letter providing guidance on reclassifying certain blanket positions, and we're currently evaluating that guidance as well. So today we are requesting your input and can answer any questions you may have on these concepts prior to us finalizing our estimates for the upcoming November item. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Underwood. Any uh, questions or feedback on the first discussion on the budget? Uh, Ms. Miller. Just briefly on the headquarters expansion, Mr. Chair, um, obviously this is a big concern, it's a big risk. I don't know if we're gonna talk about that during the CEO report, but just in terms of how and when we find out about the budget overruns that Ms. Underwood was just talking about, I just wanna make sure we're, we're sort of aligned on that. It's, it's, it's gonna be very significant. If, if in fact there are overruns, maybe there won't be. <laughs> it, it is part yeah. of the CEO report that I'm gonna be, that Lisa's gonna be presenting. Yes, I'll be speaking to that in CEO CEO report, Gail. Thank you. Any other questions at this point? And, and I know Ms. Underwood, you're available to, to receive any questions or uh, comments that board members have between now and November and uh, individuals, please reach out to Julie if you have any specific questions that come to mind. Thank you. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is our risk oversight. Uh, and Ms. Underwood, would you like to introduce your staff? Yes, thank you. Um, again, Julie Underwood, Chief Financial Officer. And I'm here with Phil Burkholder. He's our Enterprise Risk Manager. And Phil will be presenting the semi-annual Enterprise Risk Management Report as of June 30, 2021. First, I just wanted to quickly call out two program accomplishments for this period. Uh, we completed our annual risk and internal controls awareness staff training with 100% compliance. And then the enterprise risk management and enterprise strategy management teams have partnered to enhance risk considerations as part of the strategic planning process and their support's critical as we develop the next strategic plan. So I thank them for their efforts on that. So with that, I will turn it over to Phil to present the highlights of the report, Phil. Thank you, Julie. Good afternoon, as Julie said. My name is Phil Burkholder. I'm your ERM program manager. Uh, this report contains a narrative that describes and summarizes the two attachments. Attachment one is a heat map, which is a high level depiction of CalSTRS current inherent and residual enterprise risk landscape. Attachment two is a risk score report, which is a more detailed view of the inherent and, and residual risk scores for each of the risk categories and their associated sub risks. This afternoon, I'd like to focus our discussion on the heat map and specifically on the risk categories that changed over this reporting period. As a reminder, the heat map shows two risk ratings for each category, an inherent score or the risk without the benefit of mitigation and the residual score, which is the risk that is left after our mitigation. Overall, there were four higher rated risk categories and three risk categories that shifted over this reporting period. The risk categories where the ratings didn't change have been reviewed by staff who determined a rating change was not required. Additional details for all of these risk categories are included in the narrative of this board item. Looking at the heat map, which is attachment one that appears right after page nine on, of item 10, the risk category, the first risk category I'd like to focus on is risk category two, pension funding actuarial. Uh, overall, the inherent risk score for this category increased by three points from 19 to 22, and the residual score increased six points from 14 to 20. The increases reflect changes in the economic and investment environments partially due to the pandemic. These changes also include or also reflect the increased likelihood that the inf inflation assumption will be out of line with the long-term assumptions within the next six to eight months. As discussed on page four of this item, Inflation is a key component of two other key economic assumptions, expected payroll growth and the assumed rate of return. Actuarial staff will continue to watch these assumptions closely as part of their ongoing review of the funding plan and will next report on this trend in November as part of the review of the CalSTRS funding levels and risk report. Moving to our right uh, to risk category six, the inherent risk score for pension reform shifted down six points to reflect a reduction in the now 
direction in, in reduction in risk now that the current challenges to California rule have been addressed by the court's decision in the Alameda County case. Staff have elected to temporarily retire this risk category from the board reporting due to a low risk scores and the favorable pension reform environment. This category will not be included in future board reporting and, this, and the subsequent risk categories will be renumbered accordingly. However, staff will continue to closely monitor other court cases for potential impact to vested pension rights which may signal a change to risk environment, and we will notify the board if that occurs. Continuing to our right to risk category 10, transformational change, there is a two point shift forward in inherent risk and a three point shift upward for residual risk. These shifts reflect the challenges you just heard about in the pension solution update provided in item seven of today's meeting. As the pension solution project is a key mitigation to risk category four, pension administration, staff considered a rating change for that risk category also, but felt any changes would not be needed until after the project schedule has been finalized. The risk scores for this category, as well as risk category four, will be reconsidered once the pension, project, the pension solution project has its new schedule. So I'd like to move back to operational risk category number to eight. This, uh, this is our single largest risk category in terms of the number of sub-risks. And while it's rated in the low risk level and didn't have an overall rating shift, it is right on the verge of the median risk level and includes risks related to business continuity, collaborative model, and the headquarters expansion project. Also, we added two new sub-risks and we removed another. So specifically here, we the sub-risk we had, had addressing the pandemic related operational concerns has been removed due to the organizational effectiveness of mitigating uh, the risks around this area. A new sub-risk was added to address the risks associated with the transition to the blended working model, which includes changes to how we communicate, collaborate, and operate as an organization and the potential impacts to the CalSTRS culture. We also added a new sub-risk to address the effects both internally and externally of transitioning to a new CEO. In addition, staff continue to monitor risks specific to the COVID-19 pandemic, including but not limited to the future state and vision of CalSTRS blended work environment, ensuring a self safe and healthy workplace, exploring new technology platforms and its solutions to improve business productivity and member service and support delivery, and fostering excellent communication and high level of risk engage, of employee engagement. Overall, Staff continue to monitor organizational progress on, st on strategic plan initiatives, any budget constraints, and the overall effect of events on the strategic goals. While the risk environment overall continues to be dynamic, we are confident that the enterprise level risk continue to be adequately managed and mitigated. And with that, if you have any questions, we'd be happy to answer them. Thank you, Mr. Perkholder. I don't see any hands. Um, I want to thank you for the report. Uh, the, the color uh, schemes that you use, the ratings that are done. Um, it is really a terrific report the way it's written in terms of laying out the risks and how the staff is managing and mitigating those risks, those risks that you want to bring to our attention and raise to our uh, level of awareness. Uh, it's really well done. And I enjoyed the uh, preparation time that I had with you in terms of working, walking through it together. Uh, so uh, thanks very much for a good report in terms of its content and why the items are important to us in terms of overseeing uh, enterprise risk issues. Thank you very much. Thank you. So um, we have the next item is the legislation item. It's a very brief item. Ms. Martinez Wade is with us. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the board, Joyce Lynn Martinez Wade, Director of Governmental Relations. So for the update, I want to start out by letting you know the legislature is in the midst of the last two weeks of session, which will end September 10th. So it's quite busy across the river, if you will. Um, some of the bills in the legislative matrix that's a part of your board materials have continued to make progress. But today I'm going to focus on two of our sponsored bills and give you a brief update on both. So for SB 634, our annual housekeeping bill, it's before the governor and awaiting his action. So we're looking forward to seeing what happens with that bill with its straightforward changes for our system to make sure we can continue administering it effectively. 
And then for AB 539, which is our investment procurement bill, and we've been having conversations regarding questions that have been raised by some different departments in the administration. And so we're continuing with those. And we understand the difficulty in moving forward when a bill is in this situation. So we're awaiting word from the author's office on exactly what will happen with the bill. But I will keep you updated as this session comes to a close. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Thank you for the report, the materials. No hands, no questions. Thanks very much. Thank you. We are, we are going to, we've been um, in front of our computers for almost two hours. So uh, we're gonna take a break for 30 minutes and uh, we'll be back in 30 minutes. We're, we're about five minutes really off of the uh, time. So we made up quite a bit of time in the last couple of items. So uh, we'll take a 30 minute break. We'll see everyone back in 30 minutes. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. We're back uh, in session. We'll continue with our agenda this afternoon. And our first item back in session is our annual fiduciary training. We have uh, an appropriate time allotment. And do I see our general counsel here? Is Mr. Bartow here? If not, I'll just turn it over to our guest, uh, Mr. Berman. Mr. Barto, good afternoon. Do you want to introduce our guests? Yeah, it's day late and a dollar short. Sorry about that, Harry. Yeah, we'll still take it. Just, <laughs> just in time, though, to introduce uh, two exceptional lawyers who serve as your fiduciary counsel. Uh, if you um, remember last year, um, Mr. Bierman and uh, Ms. Dugan did your presentation, and uh, we're missing the third part of the trio. Um, Jay Chowdhury is... Uh, is also one of your fiduciary counsel. And uh, unfortunately today, Suzanne couldn't join us. Uh, so uh, Luke and, and Jay will ably take the helm. Um, Luke Bierman was, um, when I met him, he was the general counsel for the New York Common Fund. And Jay was the um, general counsel for the state treasurer in North Carolina. I met them both in the White House, actually where I first met them. And my most memorable, uh, Actually, the, the most memorable part of that trip was Jay almost ran down Leon Panetta as he was running to the Situation Room. So it was a, it was a fun afternoon. Uh, neither one of them served in that capacity. They really have not really done much with themselves since. Jay has been elected to the North Carolina Senate where he serves as the minority whip. And Luke is uh, the dean of Elon University School of Law. I think he's on a sabbatical now, but... Uh, so they have quite, but they have quite a bit of background in advising pension funds from the inside and from the outside. And I think we're extremely lucky to have them here today to lead us on the journey to the ins and outs of fiduciary council and fiduciary law. And I think they even have a picture between two rocks. If I remember that's their sort of trademark picture. So I'll leave it to you too. If you have anything else um, that you need me to assist with, I'd be happy to. Well, thank you very much. And thank you, uh, uh, Brian, for that very nice introduction. Uh, Suzanne sends her regrets that she's not able to be with us due to some personal issues that she has to deal with. But hopefully, uh, uh, Jay and I are able to uh, provide the kind of training that you're used to from us and uh, deserve uh, and, and is warranted. Um, so thank you very much. We do have a slide deck, which I guess is, it looks like it's now up. Um, and you can advance that slide. Um, I think what Brian didn't tell you was the role of the Secret Service that they played while uh, we were dealing with Mr. Panetta and other things. Uh, you maybe, maybe Brian can tell you that story some other time. In any event, um, well, let's get to our training today. Uh, we know that we're sort of at the end of the agenda and between you and adjournment and a couple other things. So uh, we'll get right to it. Um, we do start with this slide and we know uh, and from our experiences uh, and our interactions with you all and the work that you do as trustees, uh, you, you have a hard job, kind of like that sheep uh, between a rock and a hard place. There's a lot of 
there's a lot of folks uh, who exert some influence and pressure. Uh, there's a lot of responsibility. Uh, this job has not gotten easier over the last uh, few years. Uh, and you all deserve a lot of credit for doing it. Uh, but you're kind of like that sheep, uh, really in a tough spot and trying to navigate a way through because a lot of those issues that you have to deal with uh, could go in a lot of different directions. And your role as fiduciaries, uh, as trustees, uh, is really to navigate your way through those rocks and hard places. Now, we know that sheep made it through uh, and navigated through that difficult point, because if you go to the next slide, um, you'll see that there's not a, not a sheep on there, but a person that happens to be my son-in-law, um, which may say something about my daughter's judgment, but uh, we know that he navigated off of there, the sheep navigated off of there, and you all are able to navigate as you exercise your fiduciary responsibilities and really, uh, uh, really in very difficult uh, and challenging times, but you're able to do it. Uh, because you stay true to the responsibilities and duties that you exercise, the obligation to the fund, uh, and most importantly, to the teachers and the retired teachers. Um, so if we go to the next slide, um, I'm just going to define in a very high level uh, the responsibility that you all have, uh, the fiduciary standard that you have to adhere to as you do the work. You've mentioned today, as we, as Jay and I have listened to your conversation and your meeting, uh, you, you, very high functioning board, very aware board, very engaged board, very involved board. Uh, those are the kinds of things that we like to see uh, when we do these uh, these exercises and we talk to trustees. And you know, and you actually have have expressed today, uh, you understand that the fiduciary duty is the highest known to the law. Um, it, it requires a pure heart and an empty head. Those are not enough. Uh, you have to actually go beyond fairness and honesty. You have to act to further the beneficiary's interest. And you know that sometimes you have to put uh, your interests or, or the, the interests that you bring uh, behind the interests of the trust of the beneficiaries of the fund, because that's the, not only the primary obligation, it is the exclusive obligation. Uh, and you're familiar with that. And, and we've heard that expressed today. And we've seen uh, we've seen the deep questioning that you do, the preparation that you do. Those are all things that reflect uh, the fiduciary duty. So again, uh, we're very happy when we see those things as fiduciary lawyers ethics lawyers we like to uh, we like to see that um, we thought we would start with an exercise uh, and a hypothetical um, because this is a, a highly functioning highly engaged highly aware highly mature board uh, so if we go to the next slide we'll just um, uh, I'm sorry slide 11 right uh, this is a hypothetical that we've used before we've not used it with you all uh, but it is a hypothetical that we use and you can see um, in these facts, uh, and I'll just give you the facts and you can take a look at this. Uh, you're a board member uh, representing a labor union. Members are the bene are beneficiaries of the fund. Uh, as the members are, are facing reductions in hours or pay, maybe even furloughs, the union wants to provide benefits to its members. And again, this is a union that you represent, you would represent to help them through the pandemic or the other challenges that they have. Uh, and, and the suggestion is to you, as the trustee uh, to advance retirement benefits to members whose pay uh, has been affected by the pandemic has been reduced. And of course, now you have to figure out how do I respond? I've been selected and I'm from this union, yet my loyalties go in a particular way as a fiduciary. Any suggestions? And I'm, I'm not sure I can see the, um, the hand raising or so um, um, Mr. Chair, if you wanted to call on folks, if you see a hand up or whether that hand is the electronic one or, or just some, uh, the members just want to want to weigh in here. Uh, you, you all are not a bashful group. Sure. Can I help if I, as well? Yeah, we'll make it a group effort. Absolutely. You could always call on someone randomly too. Oh, we like to do that. We, our stu my students love it when I do that. There's- Mine too. <laughs> Any suggestions, ideas? What would, how would you respond to the members uh, as they suggest this idea uh, to help uh, their membership and as you are exercising your duty at a board meeting? Go ahead, Sharon, jump right in there. 
I have no experience with this whatsoever. <laughs> but, <laughs> we, but, um, we thought this might be a little familiar. Yeah. Well, and I, there's other colleagues on the board as well. I, I mean, I, I think we take our role pretty seriously in terms of what hat we're wearing when we're in these meetings. And so, um, you know, I would speak to the president of the local and, and just defer to them to follow up with staff. So that's typically how I conduct myself is connecting union leaders with staff members at CalSTRS to solve problems. But uh, once the connection's made, I stay out of um, any more conversations, especially since I sit on the appeals committee. So. What do you what what implications are there for the as you think about your fiduciary duties? What implications are there? What 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 goes through your head that motivates you to act that way? I think it's just it gets messy. I don't want there ever to be an implication that somehow, you know, my kind of the duty of loyalty that somehow I'm still a loyal union member, but still um, on this board, my sole loyalty is to the, you know, beneficiaries of the fund and to be a fiduciary. So I think just making sure lines are really clear and not gray or fuzzy. And not that I don't get asked at times, but I think I just try and make those boundaries really clear so that there's never any kind of implication that, um, that I'm not acting on the at the best interest of all of the members of Calster is not just my local or certain people. Um, so I think keeping those roles really distinct is is a really high priority for me on the board. That that idea of messiness is a you know that's a that's a technical fiduciary term. We don't <laughs> like messy. Uh, you know we like clear lines. We like it to be clear. That in in one way that we often present this is sort of the two hat rule or really the one hat rule is what we you know people wear multiple hats uh, as they come into these jobs and these responsibilities. But when sitting around the table or in the screen, whatever it is you happen to be sitting in at any particular time these days, but in, in exercising these duties, there really can't be any messiness. Uh, the, the responsibility is pretty clear uh, and the responsibility has to be to everyone uh, and, and to maximize the value of the fund, uh, not, at the ex not, not at the expense of anyone, at the benefit of everyone. Uh, so we don't, we don't like messy. messy. Messy raises a lot of concerns for us. And, and again, that one, that one hat uh, is a very important uh, sort of icon or moniker uh, of the responsibilities that you have. Jay, did you have anything to think about here? No, I, I mean, um, Luke, I, I think uh, you know, we've lifted this idea of duty of loyalty and wearing one hat, hat and the duty to the beneficiaries with Ms. Uh, Hendricks clearly identified. Um, you know, one, one question for you as we think about this hypothetical and sometimes changing these facts makes us think about different applications of fiduciary standards, what if the benefits were paid out to all beneficiaries and not just ones limited um, to union members? How, how, how would that alter the analysis? Does that change things if we're, if we're advancing retirement benefits to everybody as opposed to just the union that you might represent? Does that offer a you know, does that change how many hats are you wearing a hat and a half now? Or, or? Uh, Well, I guess I also look at it in terms of function. That to me, being on this board, our role is oversight and to have kind of oversee policies and um, kind of a big picture role. And to me, when you're talking about, you know, um, payouts to members, that, that, that seems like a fairly different function. So to me, I think, again, those lines seem pretty distinct to me and I'm pretty comfortable kind of deferring to other people whose role it is to sort that out and, and that that's not my role as a fiduciary. So to me, it doesn't necessarily matter, you know, who's receiving, you know, um, whatever it is that maybe it's a financial benefit or something like that. It, it, the audience doesn't necessarily matter. I think it's more an issue around function. In my, in my mind, but you can let me know if I'm thinking about that <laughs> in a, in the correct way. 
No, I think that's right. And, and benefits, you know, benefits are defined. Uh, that's sort of the, you know, a real, another technical term. Uh, and to change that may well uh, alter the way in which you are required to exercise the responsibility uh, in thinking about it. I've wondered what about, okay, if you're not advancing benefits, what about, or whether before it's- you, Before some, you do, Luke, Luke before yes. you do, let's call Mr. Prasant into this. I see that he raised his hand. So. Oh, sorry. You bet. Okay. I, I didn't see Stop. that. Sorry. Yeah, let's pull him in. So, Luke, uh, let me just ask you, uh, do you have any obligation uh, to explain uh, why you are not uh, in the lane to do that? I mean, don't, don't you have an obligation to say, as a fiduciary of this trust fund, my first and foremost obligation is to ensure that the beneficiaries of these pension funds receive, receive their pensions in a timely and accurate way. I mean, I mean, rather than, you know, I, I don't know whether I'm, I'm, you know, splitting hairs here, but it seems to me that this, it, it, you know, at some point, you know, the, the requester of, a, of, of something like this, the person who makes that request, you know, you should hear uh, either through the general counsel or maybe even the trustee, uh, him or herself, uh, that that's an inappropriate request to make of a fiduciary. One of the things that we do like to see, and again, I think this is something you all do quite well, uh, but one of the things we do like to see is that transparency, um, you know, lots of communication, uh, clarity. Um, so there's there's less confusion about, you know, what responsibilities are, what benefits are. Those all do go to a variety of the duties of the of the of the board to make sure that members understand, how, you know, the function, what they're entitled to, how they're entitled to it, uh, what the different roles are. Uh, and that kind of transparency, that kind of communication, that kind of common understanding among the board uh, and having the board operate as a single entity in that regard, those are all aspects of the fiduciary duty and responsibility. Unfortunately, we don't always see boards work that way. And, you know, you can look around the country, read some headlines and understand that those are significant problems to accomplishing that goal of maximizing the value of the fund and maximizing the benefits that are paid to the uh, to the beneficiaries. Those those are the kinds of situations where, you know, the kind of work that Jay and Suzanne or I do uh, would be very different than this kind of a conversation yeah. uh, and the way in which we interact. So you're, 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 you know, you're spot on in thinking about that the board has a responsibility uh, and to think about how to exercise it. I don't think there's just one way to exercise that responsibility. There's lots of ways in this day and age to communicate. There's lots of ways to, uh, you know, to be transparent. Uh, you know, and California is a big state. There's people in lots of different places and lots of different ways to reach them. But so, I think your fundamental point is well taken. Well, if I can make a suggestion, uh, from my perspective, I think uh, recognizing that Sharon is obviously going to be put in a hot, you know, in a, in a difficult position, uh, that maybe the staff, when they have outreach, you know, the, the administration of CalSTRS, when they have these outreach programs, for you know to the uh the membership that they explain what the trustee is required to do and so that there might be a way to stop this kind of request ever being made i'm surprised it is made uh you know to be perfectly honest but i represent the general public so you know i, I i'm, I'm going to be surprised by a lot of things in this area but uh you know the bottom line is is that you know, to avoid having her be placed in that position, why don't we just have staff, you know, in the outreach programs, explain that in the educational programs that we have, that trustees are, you know, if they have a request with regard to, you know, accessing uh, or how pension funds are used, make it to the, uh, make it to the staff so that, the, that she's not going to be put in that position. Uh, Mr. Hey, talk to my lawyer, Brian. I said, talk to my lawyer. <laughs> yeah, Thanks. I wanted to po point out that you do, uh, your board governance manual has a section on undue influence, where if a board member feels that they're being overly lobbied or someone's exercising undue influence, 
to, to report it to the general counsel. That's not quite the nuance you're talking about, Bill. No. I think it would be, when you reach that point, I think it would be pretty obvious to everyone. But right. I do think you make an excellent point about the necessity to to communicate outwards uh, what the fiduciary limitations are on board members. So I think that's a excellent suggestion as a staff member. I think we've we've written that one down, and uh, we'll talk about that for sure. Great, and, and you know your your idea about being surprised about the way some of these issues come up or what those issues actually are. Um, you know, you, you, you don't need a very big imagination, but people have big imaginations about, you know, requests and things that they think you all should be doing. Uh, so don't be too surprised by some of the suggestions that might come up. Uh, we, we've seen a lot of things that are, um, are, you know, interesting, uh, and, and, uh, you know, they come up in funny ways and that sometimes aren't really all that funny. Why don't we go? I'm sorry, Sharon. If you wouldn't mind, because um, I think what Bill raises is important, and I think it it does depend on you know trustees having that willingness to kind of you know to say you need to speak to staff or kind of make that difference. I think because I do think there's pressure if you're a political appointee or governor appointee or however you get to the board, I'm elected. There's sometimes you know pressure to kind of overpromise and underdeliver. <laughs> you know, you kind of think we could do more or be able to help or even out of the goodness of your heart, you know, um, and the motivation might not be. Um, so I, I think it just, it, it just reinforces, I think how important it is for us to really be clear about what our roles are as fiduciaries and to just, I literally have been trained over the years now, just, you know, talk to our general counsel or speak to a staff person, not to, you know, um, defer everything, but I think it just helps us to not, again, get in that messy situation that we don't want to be in and have clear boundaries, which I think at the end of the day, just helps us all do our role. The legislature has a really clear role on, you know, funding and um, there, everyone has a part to play in how we are able to provide benefits for our members. And so I just think we have to be clear on the different roles we each play and just make sure we I don't know if the right word is stay in your lane or stay in that role or make sure those are, are clear lines of, of delineation. So good good to remember that messy is bad. That's something that we don't want to see. I, I think too, you might keep in mind that um, you know, sometimes um, you know, if you are in an, in an engagement of some kind with someone uh, over an issue that is, you know, whether it's controversial or just new or, or different, um, remember that there are also confidential aspects to the work that you do. And, you know, engaging in conversation, again, no intent here, but engaging in conversation, conversations can go lots of different ways. And, you know, you might think about, um, you know, making sure that, uh, again, messy is not good. So to stay in that lane of, of what is, you know, transparent, but also what is confidential, what has, uh, you know, um, um, you know, is unique to the fund that you don't want to share. There are things like that uh, in investment strategies, other kinds of approaches and things that you do. So, you know, again, complex issues, rocking a hard place, that sheep, my son-in-law, uh, you know, you're trying to navigate uh, you know, difficult and sticky situations uh, to get to a safe place that is consistent with those duties. Um, and with that, why don't we turn back? I think it's slide five that we would look at now. Um, and yep, that's the one I think. Jay? Yeah, uh, th thank, thanks, Luke. And a you know, quick thanks to Chair and uh, Mr. Bartow. And the discussion has been so excellent. I'm going to go through um, the few fundamental principles of fiduciary uh, duty and standard, and uh, the discussion really serves as a great foundation. I mean, one of the things I think just to emphasize what uh, Luke Bierman just talked about in the fact of the fiduciary standards uh, really being the highest known to law, I mean, I think one of the things that's important to point out is that uh, while fiduciary duties oftentimes can be compared to corporate of fiduciary duties. In fact, the legal standard for pension fund trustees is actually more strict than what you find with corporate uh, fiduciaries. And that's because pension beneficiaries don't have the same rights as corporate shareholders to approve or influence your actions. So I, mean, think, I think when we have this discussion, uh, keep that 
uh, very strict and high standard in mind as we uh, we go through just a quick review of the fiduciary principles. So the you know, first principle here is really the exclu- exclusive benefit rule. Uh, this is a rule that's established under the Internal Revenue Code, uh, the code that's set up by the Internal Revenue Service that essentially says that no part of the corpus or principal or income may be used or diverted for purposes other than uh, for the exclusive benefit of the employer beneficiaries. I mean, we can really think of this as similar to what is the duty of loyalty. It's very similar to, to the to the example hypothetical one that Luke raised in the discussion that uh, we had, especially with Ms. Hendricks and, and your response, and, and I think identifying kind of the two hats that one wears, but ultimately one hat that you have to wear, which is the duty that runs to the beneficiary and all um, CalSTR beneficiaries active and retired. Uh, the second duty is the duty of prudence. Um, this is a standard that's imposed on fiduciaries to have an active duty to understand what's going on. Uh, fiduciaries without a sufficient understanding of, of an area have also responsibility to hire people with background and experience to give them the appropriate device, uh, advice. Um, and you can't really rely solely on experts. It's, it's incumbent upon you as fiduciaries to ask questions, consider uh, different opinions, and then act prudently. And um, I think Luke and I were on the call um, from this afternoon, and there was a very active engagement in asking questions, uh, because this applies not only to staff, but third-party contracts that you may have as well. So that's really uh, the duty of of of, of prudence. And then we have the duty of loyalty. Um, This really can be divided into four areas. One is really just avoiding conflicts and self-dealing. Uh, This issue becomes um, especially important for public officials that may be participating or making decisions so that your official position is not seen as something that will benefit you personally or your immediate family. Uh, There's the duty of uh, there's also the duty of impartiality that falls under uh, this this duty of loyalty. And that's really an obligation uh, to identify and take reasonable steps and efforts to balance really the conflicting interests of different uh, beneficiary groups. So, for example, you all have to balance your interests towards um, active employees versus retired employees. There's also, this is also a duty of impartiality is also seen as a way of balancing the interests of younger versus older um, participants um, as well in, in the in the pension fund. And then lastly, in this area is really the duty of confidence of confidentiality. And Luke just raised this in the example in hypothetical one in information that you may or may not share with a third party organization. But obviously, as board members, y'all will receive information that's confidential, attorney client, confidential, uh, privileged information, maybe confidential information about your members. But it's very important uh, that you maintain the confidentiality of the of the information that you receive. And uh, you, know, you will go into closed session. Your general counsel will inform you of when the duty of confidentiality will kick in. Uh, and then really the last Propri- part, I'm sorry, Jay, uh, let me just inter- interject proprietary information as well. You know, so business information, uh, the competitive advantages that you have from your size, from your investment strategies, those sorts of things are, uh, you know, very important in terms of confidentiality and thinking about maintaining that, uh, you know, those those advantages for the fund. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Jay. No, that, that's right. And I think uh, this often comes up with uh, particular trade secrets that you may be privy to as well. So that's a that's a that's a good example. Um, and then lastly, really, is the duty of care. And under that is really uh, the, the duty to diversify the investments. I mean, this is obviously um, stating the obvious, but you want to make sure that you have diversified your assets and that you're not relying on a set uh, percentage uh, of a of a certain asset that may make up a large part of your asset allocation. Um, we also uh, we also have the duty to, of delegation of, of, of delegating authority to staff, but also to third party. And if you do so, and again, if if that delegation is made, it's incumbent to have a robust process for the selection um, of that individual or contract to make sure that you are providing instruction. Uh, to that to that uh, delegate uh, the, the the authority that's been delegated and that you also have a monitoring and oversight um, and evaluation of of whoever you are delegating that authority to so it's it's important to build trust uh, with staff or that third party but it's also important to obtain independent information to verify whether in fact the staff and 
and the third party reports that are presented to you are reliable. And again, I thought we, we had an excellent example of that in today's uh, the board meeting. And then lastly, uh, really is the duty to follow the plan documents. Um, and this, this is particularly important because um, obviously there are a lot of governing documents that govern um, pension funds and making sure that there's an adherence to those plan documents is, is important. I mean, we have seen case law in instances where participants may allege a breach of fiduciary duty because they may involve excessive fees that one uh, finds or there's been a failure to properly investigate um, investment options. And so um, making sure that you establish a detailed decision-making process uh, that reflects uh, that reflects the way that decisions are made from an investment perspective, I think is is um, is very important. And you know, one of the one of the examples that comes to mind, Luke, based on our experience at our respective pension funds, was this idea of doing a review and looking at the governance document and making sure that the decision making that was made for the rel for the for each investment tracked the governing document to make sure that there was an adherence and ultimately really reflects this notion of both duty of care and I think duty of prudence uh, that, that allows trustee members, I think, to have comfort in knowing that uh, the pension fund is adhering to these high standards of fiduciary principles. And if, um, you, go ahead, if you go ahead two slides, if that's okay, that, you know, yeah, the, app, the, right, the application as Jay has indicated, you know, comporting the, conduct with the plan documents, but it is really about the process and it doesn't outcome performance while important and things that we want to look at. It's really about the process, making sure that the process comports, that it is of high level, that you are engaged and informed the kind of things that we heard today with regard to questions uh, and knowledge of the materials that you're looking at. And on the next slide, the corollary of process is, of course, documenting, and uh, it, it, it makes our fiduciary hearts ring true when we hear people say, like, make sure the record reflects uh, when you're asking questions or getting information so that you are sure that there are some uh, and, and that you are following uh, and demonstrating that you are following uh, those activities. If, if I can add just one other comment to, to these um, two slides, especially on the issue of process, I think uh, if we just go back to the previous slide, I think, I think one of the important examples I think is process is if you have a sloppy process, but you, for example, have uh, an outstanding investment, an investment that beats the benchmark, um, that's not a defense to a duty of prudence because it, it is really about the conduct and not the outcome. And that's why process, process, processes is incredibly important. Um, and really as an extension uh, to this duty of prudence, there is also the duty to monitor and take corrective actions when appropriate. And we've seen, again, Supreme Court law that has pointed out that if there is a failure to monitor investments or the failure to remove an investment that may be imprudent, I mean, there is a fiduciary duty that flows uh, to the board to make sure that you adhere to that as well. And why don't you go ahead two slides? And of course, the application of fiduciary principles applies not just to, you know, sort of the thing everybody gets all excited about or the investments, because that's so important, but really governance, administration, benefits, uh, expenses, the budget, um, administration of the plan, uh, the selection of uh, of consultants and and others who help you do the work and maintaining uh, you know control and oversight um, of that work and and you know it really extends beyond uh, to these non investment related activities and if you don't do these things and if you go to the next slide uh, of course there is always you know some risk associated with breaching that fiduciary duty and not following it again you, you can read headlines you can see litigation. Uh, you know, the concerns about, of course, the exclusive benefit rule, if you break that uh, and the IRS gets involved with regard to the qualification, that's a very serious issue. And what we tried to avoid headline reputation risk. And of course, there's liability risk uh, for for members uh, who act in particular ways outside of the fiduciary responsibility. Um, and why don't we go to the next slide? And the next one, what? sorry. And we thought we could yeah. have yet another hypothetical situation that Jay will walk us through. 
Right. And um, I, I think, as mentioned, I can't see the board members, so I'll rely on the uh, chair or whoever raises their hand to um, help through through the discussion of the hypothetical. But in this in this instance, you have a board member who has a whose principal represents a geographic district in your city. Uh, that principal is seeking help uh, for small businesses in the district to stay in operation during the pandemic. Um, the idea would be for the pension fund to offer low interest, uh, below below market rate loans to small businesses in the district. Um, how do you how do you respond? So, I'd be interested in hearing from the board about your response, or even some of the questions that you feel like you should ask in order to uh, obtain additional information and kind of uh, exercise your duty of prudence, responsibility, or even your duty of loyalty. Um, uh, responsibility too. I think those are two big duties that arise in this hypothetical. I'm probably giving away part of the answer now. <laughs> any any thoughts or questions um, about this hypothetical? Uh, what if you changed it to um, the um, the government wanting the pension fund to invest in a particular area, let's say a state or a local government? Okay. We can and I can, that, what would that analysis be? In other words, that there's a you've seen this before. The legislature is uh, considering a bill where they want pension fund to invest in a particular area, a particular or a particular um, result. How should uh, board yep. members take a look at that? How should they analyze that? So I. So I, I think that's a great I think that's a great alteration to the uh, fact pattern. And so what what would the response be? I mean, I think I think one again going through the fiduciary analysis, um, who who your fiduciary duty uh, runs to be, to beneficiaries. How do you respond to the idea that government should actually be influencing and telling? Um, a pension fund that they should be that they should now be in the business of offering below market rate loans. Um, I mean, if there are no responses, Brian, I mean, I'm happy to I'm happy to share my opinion about this. Uh, let let Gail take a, a shot at it, and then Jay certainly <laughs> chime in. Uh, we've all been on camera all day, and the two of you are really bright and. <laughs> So, so don't take our silences. We're not engaged. We're not. We're we're in listening mode. So let me turn it over to Gail, and then maybe Jay, you can tell us how you would act if you were in our role. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe Jay, you could go first. You have, you have the right answer. <laughs> um, I think it's right. I, I think that there's a lot of these types of issues that come before the legislature um, that around you know whether or not. The pension funds, you know, I, I think sometimes it's just education of the legislature that they don't understand that this is in fact just the members money and really does not belong to anyone else for any other purpose or any other policy objective. So I think some of it is, is, is really educating that legislator and making sure they understand the purpose that the board serves and that the fund serves and that the duties you just talked about in terms of of our obligation to serve the members first and foremost, I think is, is the absolute. I, I do think though, um, it is always when these issues come up, I, I think it's a great opportunity to talk about the value of, of public pensions and of defined benefit plans and the incredible work our teachers do. And so I think it's, I, I often think obviously the answer is no, but I think how we go about sort of explaining why the answer is no is, is always really important and an opportunity to really talk about why we're also committed to, to what we do. I don't know, Jay, maybe you have something better than we have, yeah. <laughs> Before Jay jumps in, we have a couple of our colleagues. Uh, we have control, uh, we have Bill Prasant and then Controller Yee. Bill and then uh, Ben. Well, I, I'll let uh, Controller Yee go first and, and because I, <clears throat> I'd like to change the hypothetical. Uh, a little, bit, a little, little I thought that was my job. Well, you know, I, <laughs> you work for us. So, <laughs> so uh, my, my question is, I actually have a question, and that is, um, does this bump up against the whole uh, issue of plenary authority with the legislature uh, versus the, the pension fund? So, 
Uh, Mr. Brazant, did you want to go, or I, I could I could provide an initial comment because we have a question and we. No, I don't want to go. I want to change the <laughs> hypothetical. In a moment. Okay, so before I mean before we change the hypothetical, um, Luke, I'd yeah be curious to your responsibility. I mean, I I think. I think there's a very strong argument to be made. I mean, and actually Gail made that argument that the fiduciary responsibility to fund flows to the beneficiaries. It's mm -hmm. not something, I mean, it is something that would be shielded from uh, what the General Assembly would want to direct the pension fund to do. Because ultimately, I think the core of the issue of this example, for example, is the duty of loyalty that you all have um, to your to your beneficiaries, and clearly, uh, I think when you do an assessment of the benefits and the risks of an of a proposal like this, if it's proposed by the legislature, I mean, one, I, I, I mean, I don't I, that it clearly doesn't go doesn't flow to beneficiaries, and two, um, there's there's clear risks uh, that that are involved. Just 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 as a background, which is which is a very interesting. Uh, backstory. I mean, it, in Connecticut in the early 90s, they actually did use pension fund money. I mean, this is a very well-known case study where they used to where they used money to help finance and keep afloat uh, the Colt, Colt Industries. This is Colt Industries that manufactured the AR-15. Uh, the fund put 25 million dollars into Colt Industries. It was you know, it was argued as a local economic development effort by the Connecticut Pension Fund. They had 47% of stake in that company. That company ultimately filed for bankruptcy. So, I mean, it's a good example of where, you know, the pension fund had kind of strayed away from its beneficiaries, tried to engage in uh, a function that really went outside of its fiduciary scope. But Luke, I don't know if you have uh, other observations to add here. No, I think that I think you're, you know, that's the right, the right path and uh, the responsibility and, you know, coming from a state legislator that, you know, that's pretty good, um, a pretty good assessment. I don't think I, I, I too have a different hypothetical that I think is really interesting, but let's defer to, to Bill on this, uh, on the hypothetical changing, the fact changing. Well, I'm willing to bet my, my hypothetical is more apropos to this, this uh, uh, pension fund than maybe yours is. What if, uh, there is a law that says that you can't go to a certain state. And the pension fund has previously invested in that state significantly in assets that really do have to be as, as you know, uh, to manage those assets, you have to be on the ground at certain times. Um, is that law effectively prohibit you from exercising your fiduciary duty of directing your staff to go to those states despite the law that prohibits it? Well, I think you always have to remember that there's constitutional requirements that are imposed on the on the fund as well. And, you know, we know that that trumps any statutory uh, any statutory action. So, you know, again, we're we're balancing those interests. But I think we, if it, we if, use if, the word supersede, so we don't <laughs> use the word that other word we use the word supersedes doesn't trump supersedes <laughs> supersedes is a good word it's less messy yeah, yeah. I, I, a, a question for you bill has staff delegated that responsibility to do the diligence in states where there may be a prohibition uh, um and what what is the oversight of staff for if it has been delegated well, I, I, I think I would defer to staff here and maybe Brian knows because this is an issue that we confront. And so it's a real mm -hmm. issue. And, uh, and so, you know, I'd like to know what, what we do in that case, Brian. Um, so we, so it has been, um, we do analyze each request. The prohibition is not just for state employees to travel, but to pay for travel. So it's not something you could necessarily delegate to a third party to do. Uh, there is a balancing that goes, goes on on a regular basis. It really is, the, the statute talks about um, exceptions for public welfare. And you know, so in the public welfare includes the, um, the funding of the pension fund. So uh, we have a lot of assets on the ground in some of these states that have to be overseen. They have to be, due diligence has to be done. And if you know, there, it, there's losses on the investment, there's losses in the fund, and there's not, you know, it affects the state, it affects the, um, uh, the funding status. 
So those are the things that we have to balance. Those are the fiduciary responsibilities of staff to oversee um, the, the money that's been invested. So case by case analysis, we take a look at that, we balance those. We do, um, you know, we consider the plenary authority, but we really believe yeah. that the statute has uh, sufficient um, exceptions in there if they're, if they're appropriately analyzed. And, the, um, and there are specific assets that have to be overseen. We think that the law allows for that. Well, you know, not to, I, I don't want to get into, I mean, I, I, I agree. I mean, I think that that public welfare in this particular instance, just being, you know, uh, weighing as a, as a court that would have to apply the law here. Um, I don't know whether the, that law would supersede this fiduciary duty um, and the exercise of it, but, but I defer to counsel on that. But it seems well, to me, I, you know, I, I just. For, for sure. your, for your um, you know, for your um, peace of mind, we have had input on this from um, prior fiduciary counsel um, to resolve this particular issue. So there is, there's been a lot of analysis on that. Thinking the same way along the lines that you are, that you're thinking, that there are some real balancing things here and at some point it tips okay. and it, uh, it supersedes the, the fiduciary responsibility supersedes the other considerations. But I, I do think that the statute uh, allows for that. There are some specific exceptions. That's why we love you, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> one of the, one of the interesting uh, situations that I recall um, when, when in Brian's role and being asked to, to assess this kind of a situation was when another pension fund came to the, to a pension fund that was a client and the pension, the pension fund uh, number two came with a proposal with the analysis that said they could do something like this. You know, we're going to do below market housing or we're going to do below market rate because it will help the economy. You know, it will, it, you know, we need workers to be able to afford uh, to be there. We've done this analysis. It's not going to impact negatively the value of the fund. It's actually going to help the beneficiaries. And they and they came with an analysis. So, you know, you're, you're already, you know, you're already armed with some information. Um, and our approach was we needed to do our own analysis, which may run counter to your analysis. Again, funds are different. Funds have different strategies and different uh, proprietary interests uh, and, and different goals and different sizes. All of those things make a difference. Um, and, you know, those, those are the kinds of factors that go into that process, 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 document, document, document focusing on that exclusive benefit rule. And again, on, on the one hand, you know, you've got the constitutional authority that is that, that, you know, generates the fiduciary responsibility. You've also got the internal revenue code. And I think we have a slide somewhere around number six um, with that exclusive benefit rule in the code. Uh, and that is, you know, a powerful qualification to lose that qualification. Uh, you know, is is unheard of. It's it's you know, it's it's a very powerful and serious motivation uh, to make sure that uh, you know the the interests that you're talking about here and whose whose interest is paramount uh, that I the IR the Internal Revenue Code exclusive benefit direction is very powerful for that uh, for that qualification. So you know, another another quiver in the arsenal of things that you must think about as you exercise your fiduciary responsibility. Um, I think we're, we're getting close, um, Mr. Chair, to the time that you had allotted to us. I think we may actually have over, overstayed our welcome, which we don't like to do, um, but we're, we're happy to keep going if you'd like, but it's really, I, I, think you read it. I, think you, I think you read it perfectly, Luke. Uh, great timing. Um, there's always comes a point where you have to make a decision to, to move forward. I think we've covered the agenda, uh, your topic and the topic, our, our responsibility for our annual training quite well. I appreciate the preparation you did in advance uh, with your team. Thanks for the exchange of ideas and thoughts today. And job well done. Thank you. Always a pleasure. Thank you very much for your time and good luck. Thanks, Thank guys. You. Take Thank care. Good to see you. Bye-bye. Yeah. We're, we're getting close. Um, so our final uh, item here
that's not a final item on the agenda, but it's uh, Cassandra, your chief executive officer report. Great, thank you. We're in the home stretch. Um, so just a couple of items, I'm gonna cover two and then I'm gonna hand it over to Lisa to cover the last one. Um, the first is I wanted to just recognize and acknowledge the appointment of Lisa Blatnick um, as our new chief operating officer. So congratulations, Lisa. She's been with CalSTRS for um, for a number of years and has been in a number of different um, uh, roles. Just recently was her uh, chief administrative officer position. So she's been part of, an, of our executive staff for quite some time. We're really excited about her um, taking on this role and we're, um, you know, readily or, you know, focusing on filling in her position and we'll round out the executive staff uh, team shortly. So congratulations. I so said she's going to report on the HQE in just a minute. But I, the other thing that I wanted to report on was the status of our employer reporting to final benefit project, which is a project that we um, constructed in response to feedback that we had received from the board and stakeholders relative to a legislative proposal that we had uh, brought to the board in December on uh, the statute of limitations and the responsibility um, of overpayments that members may have been paid and, and who would be responsible for the repayment of those and the time frame in which we were uh, going to be requiring for uh, looking back for adjustments and to a member's benefit. We received a lot of feedback from the stakeholders at that meeting, a lot of which were really focusing on our internal processes and the problems that they had realized or have been realizing when, um, when they're trying to report accurately into the system and then how we uh, make adjustments later on. I want to make sure that we I level set the, the parameters of the population because it is a very small population, but irrespective of the population, even though it's small, we want to minimize it to the greatest degree that we can. We don't want anybody to experience a hardship because of an inaccurate benefit calculation. So uh, this past year, we've been working at um, all of the uh, areas internally with the risk, you know, with the feedback that we had received from the stakeholders on ensuring that the employers know how to report accurately, they, they have the appropriate training, that our staff are providing the appropriate guidance, that we're providing the appropriate education uh, material for um, reporting accurately with the anticipation that we have accurate benefits all the, um, uh, input from the employers to the point where a benefit is calculated at the end. And then if there is an adjustment that that population is very small. So we have done a lot of work internally on this and, and a lot of it was uh, focused on evaluating the population and how many members uh, accounts get adjusted at, at different in incremental um, periods during their retirement. And, and it does uh, level out and drop off significantly after a certain period of time. So we did a lot of data pools on that and the volumes and the costs associated with that. Um, we started working, we've been working with the stakeholders. They had put together um, a set of beliefs that they wanted us to evaluate. And we needed to do some legal analysis on, on those beliefs. And uh, we pro have provided uh, them some input on a legal opinion that we had received relative to the forgiveness of, of member benefits as a result of um, overpayments. And so we provided that to them and we're still working with them on uh, constructing a proposal that, that we can move forward. At this time, we don't think that we'd be able to have anything um, that is uh, ready for prime time in November, but we do want to continue to work with the stakeholders so that we can get a, a legislative proposal that is um, to the point that it's an achievable uh, uh, product when we bring it to the board next year. So with that, I'll, I'll pause and get some input from the board if you have questions on that. Uh, Ms. Bradford. So I just wanted to say, first of all, thank you to all of the business areas and CalSTRS that have worked on this. Um, I think it's become a much larger um, project than we had anticipated when we thought we could have something by November. Um, I am hoping that we can continue working on this, and, but I think that it's always good when we have kind of goals and deadlines. So um, if my colleagues agree with me, I would hope that we would have staff continue to work on this and hopefully get some kind of legislation for the next legislative session. 
Thank, thanks, Denise, and thank you to you and Ms. Uh, Yamamoto for attending a lot of the meetings and being actively engaged on this issue uh, directly with some of the stakeholders and our staff. Thank you. And then the last thing that um, we wanted to report on was the status of the headquarters expansion project, and Lisa's going to go ahead and brief you on that. Yeah, thanks, Cassandra, and, and thank you to Chair Keeley and the board. I'll start with the status of our final permit. A few days after our last board meeting, I actually received a communication from Chief Greeno. He's the chief of the Fire and Life Safety Division of the Office of the State Fire Marshal. And as to my presentation that I had given to the board in July, and although we disagreed a bit on how we had gotten to this point, it was a very positive conversation and he committed to ensuring resources to, on his end and a more open dialogue with our team and the Office of the State Fire Marshal moving forward. Cassandra and our construction team met with him and his team on July 14th to go over future schedule and expectations regarding the phase four permit. We made an agreement at that time to section out the fire protection and fire alarm portions of the permit so that we didn't delay our construction efforts any further. And we received the critical path portion of our construction permit on July 30th, which was a huge win for the project. It was something that we had been waiting for and it gave us the authority to move forward on our construction efforts. I wanna say that we're also really confident those additional portions of the final permit will be delivered um, soon and uh, within the critical time frame, based on the positive feedback we've received from the plan checkers so far. We're really collaborating in a way where we've opened up communication. We're now talking with the fire marshal's office once or twice a week. We're talking through the changes that are being made to those final two um, portions of the permit. We're able to make the corrections on the fly and do a slip, a slip check process. A slip, check, uh, a slip check process to where we don't have to wait for the entire um, plans to come back to us for us to make the corrections and then send those, send those back for their review. So we're doing it on a, a more iterative basis, which I think has is, is really been helpful. From a construction activity perspective, we have more than 150 crew members on site with lots, lots of activity going on. The brow of the exterior of the building is being constructed that will support the exterior panels of the building. The block masonry walls in the parking garage are going in, interior uh, walls are being framed, and materials are all being staged. And most exciting, the bridge connecting the two buildings um, will be put in place in the coming weeks. So you'll like, actually see how the campus will come together. As we've been reporting to you, the project completion has been delayed from July 6th to, to December 21st. And that delay will come with an increase in cost above and beyond the available contingency due mostly to the fact that we'll need to keep our construction team on the project longer. And I can share that the team is committed to finding options to resequence, resequence certain activities and will run crews six days a week to bring in the schedule where they can. I wanna remind the board too that we have 21 weather days and 30 days slated for inspection including into, included in the revised completion date that we may or may not need, which can also bring in the cost. To um, Gail's comment in the in the uh, budget portion of the of the meeting, um, we are expecting a, a time frame of January to bring the um, the estimated cost overruns to the board. And the reason for this is there's a lot of different variables that we still have to consider. Um, for instance, um, we've got 21 weather days. If we can button up the building between now and January, we'll know better whether those days will be able to be um, given back and pull back our schedule. In addition, although we don't see any future COVID costs, um, we never know what's on the horizon for that. And so we don't want to give up all of our contingency um, related to COVID um, because we just don't know what's gonna happen between now and the completion of the project. And by January, we'll also have some inspections under our belt. So we'll know a little uh, better as to how the fire marshal is proceeding. Even though they do plan checks, they could get on site field inspection and see problems. And so we wanna make sure that we get a couple of those under our belt to make sure that um, we're on a good trend with that. So that is our plan is to come back to you, although I'll be back in November with a progress update, to come back to you in January to provide you a really detailed itemization of the cost increases, including the costs associated with COVID. And then at that time, we also wanna provide you with options. So if um, we do have some scope that's not bought out, um, and some things that we still have control over. So we wanna bring you back ideas of to, as to how we can scrub that uh, budget and maybe make some decisions based on the decisions that we still have in our uh, authority to make. So with that said, I'm open to any questions. Thanks, Ms. Blatnick, and, and congratulations on your new role. Well Thanks deserved. so much. Well deserved. Thank you. Um, I don't see any questions or 
if not, okay, I'll turn, we'll turn it back to uh, Cassandra. Cassandra, anything else in your report that you want to oh, talk about? I, Lisa, I think Yale has a question. Oh, I apologize. Um, yep, so, um, yay, Lisa, really excited. Congratulations. Thanks, um, Gail. So um, there were at least eight meetings where Jack said it wouldn't be over budget or over time. So I actually think um, I'd love to see with the chair's permission, a memo ahead of November. I, I, I really think this is, this is important. Um, this coupled with leasing rates with COVID, um, it, it's, it's significant. It's significant for our members and it's significant for the fund. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. I do have one other question for the CEO's report when appropriate, Mr. Chair. Oh, uh, uh, please please do so now. Yeah. I just, um, I'm hoping, and this could be for another meeting, um, I, I just am hoping that given, you know, we have these big increases in retirements, we talk about it all the time. I, I do think that actually is correlated to the COVID pandemic, as you pointed out, Ms. Lichnock. What I would just love to, if, if it's possible to just track, if, if those are continuing to go up, just, and I know that you do this with with Mr. Lamoureux and the the and Mr. Reed and the actuarial team, I just want to make sure we, we have a really good sense of that as as we sort of go through this year, seeing what happens with the pandemic, just to really get a better sense. That was a super helpful data point you included in there, and if we could just continue to understand um, the retirement trends, I would really appreciate that. That's a great point, and and I see uh, our actuaries coming on, but I'm, I'm not going to allow you to speak right now. It's four fifteen. <laughs> Point well taken. I think in November during your report, uh, clearly that's an item we need to monitor whether or not the uh, we're seeing a spike in retirements. Due to, and I think anecdotally we know what the answer is, but we have to uh, find out whether or not there's a material increase in retirements and what it might look like. So certainly bring that back to us, uh, David, and your team and your actuary reports. Thanks for raising the issue, uh, uh, Ms. Miller. Uh, Ms. Higa. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Harry. I'll, I'll, I'll keep it brief. Just going back to the, um, the headquarters um, discussion, um, I don't know that this needs to be um, November or on the same time frame as the request from um, Gail. But, um, you know, what yesterday when we heard from our real estate consultants, we also just talked about the, the change in the real estate market, just given, given the trends um, in the industry and, and, you know, what the impact is also on office space. Um, you know, at, at the appropriate time, I, I'd like to hear, um, you know, about how we see those trends affecting the plans that we had for the building in terms of leasing and timing of how it affects our staff or how if, if or how it affects um, budget as well. Thank you. Thanks for raising that joy. And uh, let's put a little explanation point next to that item, that request. In fact, probably not within the CEO report, but perhaps a standalone item at, a, at the appropriate time on the appropriate agenda about all of the complexities around the, the campus expansion, the changing workforce, leasing, et cetera. Um, clearly a big issue that we all have to monitor. Thanks for raising it, Joy. And we'll make sure it's uh, appropriately agendized and given you the right amount of time and uh, focus. Anything else? Okay, thanks, thank you. Um, brings us to the consent items. There are two consent, there's uh, item thir oh, pardon me, I believe we do have three members of the public that wanted to speak on item 13. So if uh, staff could bring those uh, members of the public in and I'll turn it over to staff. Um, the first member of the public that would like to speak is Mary Kay. Mary Kay, go ahead. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, CalSTRS board members. My name is Mary Kay Scheid, and I am the vice chair of the retirement committee for the California Teachers Association and a classroom teacher with more than 20 years of service. We appreciate the update outlined in the CEO report and its reference to the concept belief. Before our members retire, they carefully evaluate their options. They determine the standard of living they will have based on the decades given to public service, and they decide to retire on a certain date, counting on that money to survive. When an employer reporting error or changes in CalSTRS interpretations occur, things that our members have no knowledge or control over, the resulting change in benefits throws their entire living situation into disarray. 
it's immoral, and we need to stop this injustice immediately. Retired members must not be held liable for prior overpayments except in cases of member error. On a fixed income, overpayments and unexpected reductions in the retirement benefits the members were promised are untenable and can lead to a host of personal and financial challenges for the educators and their families. Our members are not responsible for processing payroll or providing this information to CalSTRS, but they too often ultimately suffer severe financial consequences. This is an urgent matter. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comment. Um, our next caller will be Jennifer. Jennifer, go ahead. Good afternoon. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. This is Jennifer Baker with the California Retired Te Teachers Association. While CalRTA appreciates CalSTRS's recognition that additional time is needed by CalSTRS to adequately collaborate with stakeholder concerns, I'd like to note three important issues. First, as long as this issue remains unresolved, retirees will be the ones to suffer the fiscal consequences, jeopardizing the trust that they had in the security of their CalSTRS retirement benefit. CalRTA continues to believe retirees should not be held liable for mistakes they did not make and urges CalSTRS to find a path forward with a more collaborative solution to address this issue that is not shouldered on the backs of retirees. Finally, CalRTA believes this issue must be resolved in a timely fashion, and we look forward to deeper discussions with CalSTRS on how best to move forward. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. Okay, our next caller will be Derek. Derek, go ahead. Good afternoon, Chair and members. This is Derek Lennox, and I'm representing the 58 county superintendents of schools. This year, our organization has been working on a regular basis with CalSTRS staff to problem solve issues and to build the relationship between CalSTRS and your business partners in the field. We also participated in the recent series of meetings referenced in the CEO report between CalSTR staff and employee retiree and employer organizations. We appreciated that dialogue. Uh, two primary takeaways for us were first, the fact that CalSTRS is still investing time internally to improve its internal alignment and services to the field to ensure that there's that consistency there in the message that we all receive and that the quality of the message is um, good and actionable to ensure correct benefit reporting. We appreciate the significance of that work, as in some cases, really is condition precedent to deeper reform. But our second takeaway is the fact that uh, we are not mutually at a point where there's a path forward on a board-sponsored legislative proposal for the coming year. So we appreciated the CEO's report noting that, and we agree with that assessment. As always, we remain committed um, to additional collaboration as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, that's the conclusion of all the callers in the queue. Thank you, and thanks for facilitating. Uh, item four, and thank you to the members of the public for uh, bringing those issues before us um, and your, your thoughts on, on the issue. Item 14 and 15 are consent items on the agenda. No one's pulling anything, so 14. Uh, Bill, yeah, Mr. Prasad, Bill. You know, on 15B, I'm going to get the Karen Yamamoto Award. Um, I looked at staff present, and uh, I noted that uh, Grant Boykin was present at our uh, meeting, uh, regular meeting on July 9th, 2021. I don't think he was. So uh, we'll, we'll make those corrections. Yeah, yeah, thanks. I know that, and that, and that is picking the ultimate nit. I'm sorry. Great catch. Karen's, Karen's happy. She's Good catch. <laughs> Karen, this is, this is a, a, a grant to you. Oh, my gosh. All right. So that with, uh, with that amendment and that change, uh, 14 and 15 approved. 16 are items referred to the committee for board decision. Jennifer, did we have any? Didn't think so. Thank you. Uh, new new business is 17. Do you have any? I had the two items uh, that came out of the um, Chief Executive Officer's report regarding the HQE update and then real estate trends affecting the um, plans. Okay, any, did, 
Was there anything? I think that was it. Okay. Um, I, I would note it's probably in the minutes though uh, that we would have um, CGI represented at, at any of the future meetings of Pension Solution, which was came from Controller Yi. Um, maybe make sure that's reflected in the minutes. And um, we will. We'll make thank sure you, that's. Thank it. you very much, Brian. 18, the draft agenda for the next meeting. Cassandra, anything you want to pull off of that to bring to our attention now? or um, we, we see if we The only thing that I would uh, make, a, we may make an adjustment is on the board sponsored legislation. We plan to initially have that piece of legislation that we just spoke about um, presented, but we will probably have a smaller presentation and then add a presentation by our new business lead on that project, Jeff Zimmer, so that the board has a, a, a good um, visibility into the work that's being done as, as well as our stakeholders in the public. Thanks, Cassandra. Yep. Eight, 19 opportunities for members of the public. Any members of the public that want to address us with uh, items not on the agenda? Uh, there are no members of the public in queue. Great, uh, it's 4.31, we started at one, we took a 30 minute break and we had uh, just about three hours allotted. So we. We uh, I think we we made it. I uh, thank everyone uh, for their for the preparation of the materials, for your engagement in the conversations today. It's great being with all of you. Uh, until we see each other again, meetings adjourned. Take care, everyone. Thanks, everyone.